Well, thank you so much you for, for. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I'm a big sausage dog fan. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, that's classic. Oh, yeah. I grew up with him. Yeah, actually, I, I we had a sausage dog as well, that growing up. Is uh, it? Yeah, my dad had one. So his name was Ho <laughs> 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 which in which in South African like means like little bug. Uh, Diane, like, yeah. Oh, really? quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're right. super excited. Like, we just we always kind of catch up a little bit before our calls, you know, and uh, just talk about, you know, what do you, what do you want to talk about? And we were just like, wow, we can't wait to speak to you. <laughs> There's so much stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, we can go on all sorts of random tracks. Yeah, it's yeah. Good. Just, my brother. Oh, man, woohoo! Ooh, well done, job, my man. That was a flipping insane chat but there was a fucking gift chat yes, yes. i was like i Love was glued to my like i could have I just, talked for another two hours but, uh, but honestly i thought yes i was like <laughs> easy like you know i'm like What's up, China? Uh, great guys. <laughs> How's it going, my man? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome, my man. How about you? How's your day been? Yeah, awesome, my man. Uh, really good day so far today. Woke up and it was raining and I was just listening to the rain fall on the, the roof of my loft, which is such a nice way to kind of wake up and it kind of forced yeah. me to stay in bed as well <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah how about you you How's have the liberty it? to do so yeah that's true man that's true i must enjoy it while i can and uh, yeah, how exactly. is uh, how's your evening been there in australia yeah it's a beautiful evening however a little bit cloudy so um you know normally it's quite nice to have a look up at the night sky and uh you know wonder what's what's up there and uh, you know, I really, really do enjoy looking out at the cosmos and, um, you know, thinking about back when I was in Namibia once, there was like, that was when I really realized that there's a thing called the Milky Way because, uh, you know, being in a desert, obviously the air is so rarefied and, and, and clear and, and no moisture. And the, the stars felt when I was in Namibia like I was being bathed in this like milk. It was crazy. It was just this white, white, white sky that was, you know, even without a big moon, it felt like the lights were on. And uh, I've never forgotten that. It's just a, such a beautiful, beautiful experience. And uh, that was when I was quite young and, and uh, it really sparked my interest in sort of what was up there. Have you got a memory of like an amazing night sky yeah but yeah firstly i mean yeah just kind of it's isn't it amazing just being outdoors and having the privilege of uh of seeing those stars yeah but for me i remember being in uh, colombia and i was in this uh, little town called minka it was like on the top of this hill in this like insanely beautiful setting uh, in this hostel and it was all outdoors and I just, it was, it was actually, I think the night before my birthday and I was oh. there with like a few mates that I'd been traveling with and we were like just rocking back, like looking at the sky and like it was just full of stars. And actually for some reason that night there was, there was a lot of like sort of shooting stars and it was just, yeah, it just makes you think, hey, like what kind of is out there and it's, uh, yeah. It surely makes you curious as well, you know, and uh, and and that's actually a theme of our, our guest this week, uh, Diane McGraw, um, really, really amazing lady, super interesting, super smart, and her whole life she has been curious, uh, that's for sure, and she's her curiosity has led to a lot of experimentation, and she's you know put herself um her body and yeah she's just she's put herself through all these experiments you know like in terms of you know what's it like to not use plastic for a whole year and yes. what about um eating the leftover food from people and not actually allowing herself to buy food for a whole week and I think it's amazing, you know, the world needs people like this because it kind of opens our eyes to, you know, what is out there and, and just to also be more curious ourselves. Yeah. For sure. 
you know, I think some of that curiosity comes from the way she was brought up and where she was brought up. You know, she, uh, first of all, you know, she lived up in the outback, basically in the middle of nowhere. And so she did a lot of her schooling by correspondence. So from a young age, she was experimenting literally with the science kits that she'd get sent over to her uh, for, for school and, and just sort of have fun with that and, and, and learn uh, through experimenting. But beyond that, uh, she also had a lot of other life, life lessons uh, sort of growing up in a rural community. First of all, being super outdoorsy, just life is just lived outdoors, hunting and all sorts of things, learning to to kill and uh, take and, and eat uh, the meat that you've killed and then all of it, you know, using every last little bit of it, not just not wasting anything. And also really important themes for her life, uh, like community. She grew up in a uh, in a community of sharing and people. There wasn't just a convenience store up the road. So she, you know, they'd have to share and, and care for one another. Uh, and and that's sort of stuck with her. And it's definitely a theme uh, that's going to be used when she goes up or if she gets chosen to go up to Mars, like working together is a massive, massive skill, not against one another. Um, and uh, she also then, you know, through those times, she learned to be more frugal. And that's sort of another thing that she's sort of uh, working with at the moment. And it's been a real passion of hers that she has um, explored and studied and done research on actually. Hey? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like as part of her upbringing, I think, like you said, that's kind of led to, you know, other things in her life, um, what she has been doing for, you know, the, the last um, however many years uh, is around, uh, you know, environmentalism and sustainability and just the importance of being aware about aware of those things and, you know, like how can we use less um plastic how can we um use say less water how can we throw away less food how can we use the food trimmings um for other meals perhaps you know or other parts of fruit or animals you know in other meals so those are such important things that each of us can literally do ourselves um and take responsibility to do because it's at the end of the day it's for the better of the planet and for all of us. You know, it um, provides us with a, a nicer, healthier place to live. And, you know, she also practices that herself. And she's also keen to try and live somewhere else too, though, and take all of her learnings with her. Um, isn't she, Greg? <laughs> yeah, but this is that that crazy part of the the story where you find out that she basically is is going to be uh, if she gets selected, she's one of the the last uh, people that have been selected uh, within a small group that might go to Mars, a one way ticket to Mars, and uh, we're kind of hinting at that whole way through. But part of all that sustainability and waste management that she's kind of learned on Earth now is. Um, and will be uh, vitally, vitally important uh, should she go up to Mars. And a lot of people sort of wonder why would why would people be spending so much money on, you know, trying to go and terraform another planet. But one of the things that is abundantly clear is that the the way Earth is going at the moment, it's just not sustainable. The way we create waste and the sustainability of things is not working and things like trying to go to to Mars for example force the issue we have to learn better ways to run our systems in terms of waste and sustainable uh, yeah, systems uh, because if you don't you will die and things won't work so if we are able to figure these kind of issues out that'll be then it will translate into real world um, solutions on earth as well which is kind of the the win-win for everybody so there's so much value in these kinds of uh, pushing the the barriers and the frontiers of science 
and um, you know, I think we're really grateful for for that. So I think this is a good time to to listen and hear what Diane McGrath, uh, what it's like for Diane McGrath to be ridiculously human. Nice. So we're here with uh, Diane McGrath, uh, all the way in Victoria, professional speaker, consultant, coach, PhD researcher, writer, Mars One astronaut candidates welcome to ridiculously human podcast thanks guys awesome to be on thanks for inviting me yeah awesome thank you so much for coming on and uh yeah we're just super excited to have a chat to you you've um really doing some super interesting stuff and uh stuff that gareth and i are particularly interested in as well and and uh we sort of seem to uh connect on a lot of uh, similar subjects that you're busy with and uh, researching so we're really excited to get into it. So how's your day been so far? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one of those had one of those mornings. You know, I was, um, was uh, rode into town uh, with train, bike, um, worked out at the gym, etc. And then I was heading home, and of course, flat on the tire. Oh no! Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I was just covered in road grime. I'm obviously clean now, but I had to you know, change a tube at the down in the city and just hand pump. There was no good pumps, and just oh. I got home eventually, but about an hour and a half, two hours later, in plan. Yeah, you know, but the day was lovely. Yeah, you've kind of got to just embrace it when it happens. You know what I mean, and not get too upset. Got to let it roll because what can you do? You just got to fix the tire and move on. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that's uh, not going to be far off. But a troubleshooting is going to be very much <laughs> part of your life. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, most of us have some issues that just go wrong. Sometimes you can really let them get to you because I thought it was one thing and then there was another thing. Is that I, I went to use another um, pump, but it broke the valve on my tube. And that's when I had oh. to get a new tube and then the, the actual pump didn't work. So I needed to get another pump. So... There's a point oh, sometimes you get that threshold yes. hold where you just want to go, okay, <laughs> that's enough. And I kept on these, these things that are escalating, but it's like, okay, just breathe deeply, sit down, take this tube out of the tire and you want it. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and when those things happen like first thing in the day, like you can understand why some people's day, it almost, you've got to try not let it set the tone for the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well it's, honestly, it can only go one way after that. It's only going to get better. There you That's go. True. That's the way to look at it. Hundred <laughs> percent. So yeah. So what is a day? What is a sort of a typical day in the di- in the day of uh, Diane uh, look like? G- generally speaking, the last few weeks or months. Last few weeks or months. It just depends on what day. I sort of balance my time. Fifty percent of my time, or roughly, is uh, doing my PhD work. I'm just a bit over halfway through my PhD, and all I'm doing is writing, 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 writing. Um, my chapters and uh, and publications, and the other half of my week is uh, my Mars One and speaking and uh, and various experiments and random <laughs> random things days. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but each day starts with a routine. I have the same sort of routine um, pretty much every day, which is really helpful when you move around constantly, like I do house sitting. Yeah. Yeah. So may, may I ask a little bit about like a uh, writing a PhD because. We we've, mm. we've both started writing a little bit recently, like just literally like blogs and things. But there, there, there's, yeah, yeah. there's there seems to be an art to it, you know. So you you'll write and it'll be a a draft, which is literally your copy, and then mm. you'll go and you'll refine it, and then sort of you know refine it again. Like how does it work with a PhD? Because you know you're writing hundreds of thousands of words. I'm not sure how many is it. I mean it's it's plenty. Um, oh. Uh, you know, oh, God yeah. knows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the chapter I'm working on at the moment is nearly 70 pages for that chapter. Wow. Um, and that's, it's just because um, this is the methodology. But my research is quite, um, it's it's a little bit, not complex, but there are multiple stages to it. So I have to describe them in such a way that anybody could pick it up and actually put that in place. That's the, the point of the methodology to justify how you've done it so it's replicable for others. Um, but, yeah, to, to write, I mean, it's actually, it's not too dissimilar to any other writing practice. I think that if you carve out the time to write, it's going to happen. If you just sort of think, I might do some this weekend or I might do something, 
yeah. I mean, we we all know that the great writers usually do that sort of thing. They'll they'll set their their deep work or their good their writing time, their quality time at certain times of the day, often in the morning. And I tend to do the same sort of thing on the days when I'm writing. I'll really chunk most of my really deep writing um, in the morning to to early afternoon, and then it's just fiddling around with stuff in the afternoon, like checking references or doing some stats or things like that. Yeah, but the it's fun discipline. stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, I, a random fact about me: I love I love statistics. My oh undergraduate my degree is actually um, I am a secondary maths and English teacher in my undergrad, and uh, and I majored in statistics for four years. Wow. <laughs> okay, uh, no, you're one of those. I, I, I'm I'm on the same wavelength as you. I love those. I love numbers and stats and stuff. Yeah, I don't wear a pocket, uh, you know, protector for pens okay. or anything anymore, or a cardigan. But uh, I think. It's just, <laughs> You know, with with regards to writing, you, I've often heard people say things like, you know, when inspiration strikes or things like that. But, you know, hearing you speak and, and hearing a number of other people talk about writing, it's like you have to create the inspiration. You have to sit there and li- and make the time, like you said. So perhaps mm. you could give us a tip on how you actually get started or how you get into the flow. Um, well, actually, inspiration does occur sometimes. And, in mm-hmm. fact, one of the places to get in flow is often in a meditative um, place, whether that's walking, whether that's some people get it in the shower, um, running, whatever it is. So some place where you have um, your mind is in a, uh, a state that's, that's open and it's not distracted by a whole lot of other stuff that allows things to actually come forth. Uh, so I tend to make sure I have a meditative practice um, in the morning and usually exercise in the morning as well. So often that will help me come up with some some thoughts and ideas. Um, and then before I start writing, like I actually schedule in my diary this time till this time is, is writing time and what I'm going to focus on. I do that the night before. Oh. Um, but before I start on that, I'll do about half an hour to three quarters of an hour worth of journaling and uh, and that will and some of that journaling will be maybe a paragraph maybe a few bullet points on something i've been thinking about my research and the rest will be other stuff but there'll be something so that my hand just starts to warm up like you do with exercise you warm up first and then you get into it and then it's a lot easier and i i I use um the pomodoro technique as well do you guys are you familiar with that or uh, um, Pomodoro technique. They call it the Pomodoro because um, those old timers in kitchens look like a tomato, a yeah. tomato. So Pomodoro, tomato, tomato timer. Uh, and you set it for 25 minutes. You write for that 25 minutes you, and it goes off and you take a five-minute break and then you do another 25 minutes, five-minute break, etc. So you do that for a prolonged period of time and then you find you're fresher when you write in those, those chunks or learn uh-huh. or when you learn in those chunks too. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's that that's a good technique. So so like quick one when cuz I find like sometimes when when I exercise I like that's when I have my greatest ideas, right? And I'm like, "Oh my mm, word." And yeah. I'm like solving all these problems whatever. <laughs> um or thinking of cool things to write about. But then when I'm finished, I like, you know, I I sort of either go have a shower or whatever the story is, and then when I'm like coming to think about what I was thinking about I forget so <laughs> how, how do you remember how, how do you remember these things because I find that that happens yeah, yeah. a lot of the time um, I use my phone okay. um, if I if it's when I'm out somewhere or like like yourself there you're at the gym you're working out or um, whatever I'll either um, use the voice recorder quickly to record oh. a short little memo for myself or um, I'll just type it in quickly into the notes section and then I'll come back to it later because it's just, it all has to be as a prompt. Yeah. That's all it needs yeah. to be. You bring it back. Yeah, um, that's true. Start to write that prompt out. Mm. Cool. You also mentioned your like sort of a, a strict uh, morning routine. Uh, yes. What does that sort of look like for you? Because I think it's yeah, vitally important to get into the zone for the day. Yeah. It's, um, so I get up. Well, actually, I don't get up straight away. I, I set my alarm uh, for way earlier than most people probably do. <laughs> Depends on what time I want to get to the gym um, or whatever I'm doing. Uh, like, for example, this morning, my alarm went off at about quarter past four, wow. I think, this morning. Um, and then I I measure my HRV, my heart rate variability. Ooh, awesome. And, and I use that to determine are you in reasonable – is your body ready to exercise today or should this be a rest day? 
Um, yes, I do schedule what my week looks like in exercise and movement, but if my body's saying, nah, then I will, I'll get up and I'll do something much more gentle. I'll do some yoga or I'll just go for a walk or I'll do a stretching routine or something like that instead. Um, but I usually use that as my, uh, I guess, my, my barometer for, for how my, cool. my physical body is going to deal with the day. Um, so that's the first thing I do. And then I check my um, how well I slept, uh, my aura ring. Um, oh, I don't cool. know if you guys have, have you guys come across it? No, not yeah, yet. So, no. No. Um, yeah, this is pretty cool. It's a, it's a sleep <laughs> tracker sleep tracker cool. so i'll i'll have a look at this and see um, what the quality of sleep was for me did i get great deep sleep or REM or etc um and often i can predict it pretty well now because i've i've had it for a couple of years um and i know what alters different aspects of my sleep because sleep's yeah. sleep's critical i mean i might get up at 4 a.m or 5 a.m but i've gone to bed at eight okay, or okay gotcha. so i've got eight hours sleep or nine hours sleep or something like that. So um, I'm, I very much play around with sleep, you know, what works and what doesn't work to increase the body's ability to, to heal really well. And, yeah. and uh, I mean, we get so much of our mental health and so forth from, from really good sleep and um, sleep is so it, underrated. <laughs> it, it, it is, eh? And um, I literally, I'm just getting a book here that I'm just about to start. It's by a guy called Matthew Walker. It's called Why uh -huh. We Sleep. Oh, yes. Have you read it? I've got that too. Yeah. No, it's, it's on my pile. I'm yeah. reading actually a book by... <laughs> yeah, I had <laughs> to Sean reach Stevens. into my pile. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's amazing how, um, I guess, underrated uh, sleep is. And, and people mm. people are just not getting enough on, of it. And that, that is probably almost one of the most simple things that people need to do to be healthier is just to take an extra yeah. couple of hours to, to rest. Yeah, and even... Even an extra hour and a half. Yeah. You know, I mean, we know our body's sleep cycles are roughly every 90 minutes, and you go through multiple cycles of these 90 minutes, you know, between light sleep, deep sleep, and so forth. And um, and if you just, it's a simple, simple trick to wake up really fresh in the morning. If you do have to have an alarm, set your alarm so it's at a 90 minute period yeah. from when you went to sleep, and you'll wake up fresher from seven and a half hours sleep than you will from eight. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very true. That's yeah. really good advice, that yeah. And and do you mind yeah. just um just explaining to uh, listeners a little bit about HRV because I think that's also really, really oh, yes. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So heart rate variability. Um. So it's it's a measure of well, I guess uh, to simplify it, it's it's the way that the um, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system um are balanced or imbalanced in your body. So the sympathetic, which is the um, paradoxically, your fight or flight, um, not gentle at all, but fight or flight, yeah. uh, and the parasympathetic, which is much more the rest and digest that people think about. And in the evenings, you'd like to think your parasympathetic has you know, got a bit more power. So, so you, you are resting, you are digesting, you are actually recovering. Um, so the HRV will be uh, an indicator that uh, perhaps my body's a bit stressed, so cortisol's high or something like that, and that the sympathetic might be dominant when I wake up. If I've, if I've been through a lot mentally or personally or even physically, um, the, that sympathetic um, measure will be higher. And the parasympathetic, uh, there are ways of, of helping that uh, improve, though, like meditation's great. So I'll often put some meditative practice before I go to sleep. There are different eating well before you go to bed. There's lots of little things you can do to improve your body's ability to to relax into sleep a lot more um, and let that parasympathetic um, rise to the surface. So so just just looking at the way that your body is just um, I guess in balance is what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you what what are you using an app for that? Because I find the HRV really really valuable as well. Like you can tell mm. so much from like it all links together. Because you also mentioned something earlier. You said exercise and movement. So like yes. implying that there's a difference. And so oh, like. Yeah. I think the movement, the exercise, the sleep, the eating, um, then you can see when you sort of pull on those strings differently, mm. then you can see how the HRV then responds to, to the changes you've made in the other uh, sort of pillars of health or in the other areas. And it's kind mm. of cool because you can gauge it all really, really well from like an objective standpoint. So what are you actually using for yeah. your HRV? 
Um, so I tend to use just a, uh, a chest monitor, um, oh, yeah. which I'll just quickly pop, pop on when um, I wake up. I just keep that next to the bedside table. And, uh, and the app is um, Sweetbeat. So I mm. found that's out of the, the – I've tried a couple of different apps, and I found for me that's been the most effective um, and consistent, I think, as well. So, but, but yeah, other people like different things. So whatever you're trying to do, um, I find that that whole element of mu- movement is is something that we we forget that unfortunately, like so many other elements of our our world. And this is a t- I'm borrowing here from the wonderful Katie Bowman, who I love her work, Nutritious Movement. Yeah, um, she's awesome. a biomechan- you, you know her, Katie? Yeah, she's yeah. Um, an extraordinary biomechanist and real nature lover. Um, and just the way we've taken out movement from our lives by being so sedentary whether it's sitting or driving or standing doing nothing we're not how much of our life is being made in such a way to reduce movement even the way we prepare food you know we don't grind coffee by hand anymore like even little (laughs) things that used to involve movement we don't do so yeah so i try and increase the amount of movement i have i sit on the ground to have dinner and cross-legged and things like that so just then i've had to do a squat to get down i have to do a squat to get up and i don't have to lift a bar yeah 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 100 (laughs) percent yeah it's so so valuable there's movement in everything that you can do and there's um there's ways to make it all like inco- incorporate into like literally everything that you do which you would have done mm. as a as a sort of a function of evolution uh we mm. would have done that and i guess over only after the sort of the last i don't know how many maybe not even hundreds of years it's kind of gone to to nothing <laughs> mm. in, in general in the amount of at- movement our bodies lose so much condition when we. I mean, has anyone here ever like broken an arm? Either of you guys broken yeah. an arm or put something in a cast? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the muscle just deteriorates so quickly because you can't move it. Uh, it doesn't take long for the for our condition to deteriorate because we don't move it very much. Uh, so if you know anything you can do to just get an extra, just walk. But walking's the yeah. best. Yeah. Walking yeah. well. Yeah, walking properly. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Do you have a do you see a sort of value there when you say walking properly with for like barefoot walking and that kind of thing or mm. uh, is that, is that kind of what you're implying there or when you say walking well? Um I think walking with awareness as well. I I think definitely walking in a space. Um I so many people just drive from A to B and you don't see what you've just passed. If you're walking, you can't help but be in that space. Uh and that's, you know, that that we we see from Japanese uh, forest bathing um, sort of studies that that being in nature has a lot of so cool. healing properties too. So so you know be in that natural space even if it is on a street but you're passing trees you're seeing birds you'll see that cat down there or the dog over there so you're much more connected. Um, but you walk it. I do I do um, if I can where possible uh, wear barefoot type shoes. I've got um, you know the the five, five toe wings. shoes are what yeah. I wear most. Yeah, I've got Vibrams. Yeah, I wear them almost all the time, except for when I have to speak. <laughs> professional. I and think then you'll they see do me smart in something ones else. now. <laughs> when you oh, have to awesome. see them, <laughs> be, be seen in public with them. <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, like right now I'm barefoot. I've got no no shoes on. That's nice. my preference is my shoes. <laughs> Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm the same. Like I, I think I've had only worn Vibrams to exercise for at least five years now. I, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine putting on a normal pair of trainers. It would just feel awkward. Oh, and it's so restrict. They're so restrictive yeah. to put on normal trainers. I broke um, one of my toes uh, earlier this year. It was only a toe. It was a little toe. And do you know how much yeah. balance you get from your little mm. toe? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was crazy, but but I couldn't put the put my vibrams on because of, you know you have the toes are separated, um, and it was out. It was massive. Ah. It was huge. Um, so I had to wear normal running shoes, and oh, I just threw my whole gait out, and my Jeez. back started going out, and everything yeah. just because of this darn wow. toe. Little so toe crazy. as well, yeah. geez. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned there that you know being bathing, forest bathing, which I freaking mm-hmm. love the sound of, but. Um, Obviously, this is linking into sort of the bigger picture of you uh, of Mars and all that. So uh, mm. I'd like to just bring it back and, and sort of just contextualize things a little bit. So um, obviously, you're going to be heading up in theory. Uh, you're one of the candidates to be going up to onto to to Mars, where there won't be any forests. 
<laughs> so no forest bathing for you. But uh, let's just, before we get into, you know, I mean, there's so many interesting things we want to get into. Let's just briefly uh, go back to your youth. What was your youth like? Mm. And, you know, where did you grow up? And you can just give us a sort of, a, uh, well, as long as you like, an intro into the young you. And then we can move on to some of the interesting stuff that you're busy with at the moment. Gosh, um, I have moved around a lot as a child. My um, childhood, I started in Melbourne, lived here for a number of years, then lived in the Adelaide Hills. Um, and then at the age of 10, uh, my my father got a job um, as essentially a bookkeeper, but uh, in, a, in the offices in um, some Aboriginal settlements uh, in the outback in the desert in the Northern Territory. So we moved up there and lived up in the outback in red, sandy nothingness for, uh, for seven years. <laughs> uh, very formative years for a young girl. And, uh, and it was extraordinary to have the, the chance to, to do that. It was central Australia for a number of years and then up in the Tanami Desert, which is quite remote um, as well in the Northern Territory. So I lived there till I was sort of 17 and then back to Melbourne. But then I moved around, I've moved around a lot since then, since finishing school. Um, I lived overseas in Belgium for a while, but I've lived in multiple states here. I don't know. It's not that, um, it's not that I feel I am not settled. Uh, I just go – the place doesn't matter. Where I feel home is is where – I feel connected to people mm. or, or what it is that gives me purpose. So the physical location really is almost immaterial in many ways. As long as I have those other important elements, then I can be anywhere. So Mars, okay, it's 54.6 yeah. million kilometres plus away. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'd still, if, if I'm lucky enough to get to go, uh, I would still be able to have email communication, um, do video messaging and uh, keep my, well, I'd still be able to tweet and um, Instagram, all that sort of stuff um, from from Mars. So pretty cool. It'll be like going home for you back to the, like you said, the red uh, yeah. sandy nothingness of your youth. Yeah, it's really interesting. And just um, I haven't I haven't actually really thought too much about it before, but that whole concept of forest bathing, it's really about being in nature. And I wonder I wonder how much of that um, requires you to physically feel the qualities of being in a natural environment or is it just standing within it? Because to on Mars would never be able to go outside of the the habitats without a spacesuit on. Wow. But there's a great there's a great vastness there. There are canyons there, volcanoes, uh, caves, um, extraordinary landforms. Uh, and just I could imagine how ex- amazing it would be just to to stand there and, and be bathed in that. But I'm curious. I do wonder if it would have a similar sort of effect as forest bathing or not. Hmm. I love that thought, though. It's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, wow. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I know we'll get into the Mars the Mars stuff uh, a bit later on, but uh, I was actually watching one of your, your videos and uh, about it, and I literally had just goosebumps thinking about what <laughs> that whole sort of exploration means and, like, just listening to the the wind storms and like how massive mm. they are and they can sort of consume the whole planet. I mean, that's going to be, those are going to be incredible things to experience. I can, mm. can only mm. imagine. Um, but you mm. know, what, what about like the Australian outback? Like, you know, we, we hear a lot about it. Um, what, what is it like and kind of, what does it mean? You know, how does it differ to like living on a big farm or whatever? Is it similar? Oh, or, or, gosh. Yeah. I mean, what is it um, like? I mean, there are a lot of big farms, essentially, or large um, cattle properties out in the outback, but um, the areas that I lived were actually um, desert areas, so um, red, barren rocks, some trees, um, some shrubs, not a lot, um, some outcrops of, of, uh, of rocky terrain or, or small hills, um, but not covered in, in green. It was... Um, Wildlife, definitely, snakes, kangaroos, um, goanna, um, emu. I mean, as a child, it's, uh, we learned to hunt at the age. My brother, um, I have a twin brother, he and I learned to hunt. We were roughly about 11 at the time um, uh, because, I mean, there's no butchers <laughs> next door. Yeah, you can't yeah. just <laughs> hop to the butchers and say, can I have a, a kilo of mince, please? Um, so we would hunt, uh, help hunt for some of the food and uh, – um, and often families in the community would would buy an entire bullock and uh, and and share it amongst 
amongst them. So I have a carving day and everything. Wow. Um, so, so food, I, I have a, an appreciation for food from uh, the whole nose to tail because when you don't have it as easily accessible, you eat what's there um, and you really do appreciate what you have. It's very different. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's very interesting, like, like you said, you appreciate what you have and I don't think people these days, they don't have any clue like sort of where their food comes from and they mm. only want to eat like a chicken breast, you know, they're, they're not interested mm. in the feet or the beak or whatever else. Uh, it's just because it's weird, isn't it? I mean, I'm talking about obviously more yeah, so yeah, people yeah. in the West because, um, mm. you know, um, the guys in the East, they, oh. they, they eat like everything, which is fantastic. And it's down. super, yeah. Yeah. it's actually super tasty. Like I, when I was in, in mm. Singapore, like I, my staff there, they gave me chicken feet to eat for lunch, which they thought was hysterical because my face was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, actually like chicken hearts and stuff are amazing too. And there's just so many yeah, good parts yeah. of those animals. Yeah. The organ meats, the organ meats yeah, are organ probably meats, more yeah. nutrient dense than the, the basic red meat that we have in steak or whatever else. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't mind, you know, consuming, um, the standard meat from an animal too, but, um, I don't shy away from the liver or kidneys or brains or anything like that. It's uh, um, they're all quite tasty and highly nutritious. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and isn't like there's I don't know if it's a theory or how true it is, but mm. if you eat say like the heart of a chicken, it's it's good for your heart too as a human or whatever other animal you are. And mm. you know the same goes for livers and brain and stuff. Mm. Um, mm. Well, it's definitely the the case for. Um, uh, I guess some of the some of the parts of the animal we don't often eat, which would be say cartilage and things like that. I mean, there um, the body takes it needs various nutrients to to generate new tissue, uh, and you don't just you can't just go down the shops and buy good quality um, cartilage. Really, it's uh, so consuming it from from um, producing your own bone broths, so like really getting those joints and and um, and cooking them for ages till that cartilage breaks down and you consume that. Yeah. You're getting the, those amino acids. Uh, mm. so that your body can then build it themselves definitely so and i think that some of those other qualities too you think about what is being processed by that animal um, through that particular organ you know what is what was its function yeah. uh, and perhaps that's you know why the the hunters in the in the tribes would often get the, those prime pieces that really mm. they'd get the organ meats wouldn't they they'd go straight for that yeah yeah, yeah. so so in in that environment that you grew up in obviously you're eating uh, a variety of different meats i mean pr probably mm. pretty healthy meats like kangaroos all mm. like wild and then sort of lean yeah. and what have you um mm -hmm. but also just briefly with the communities there um you know it sounds like quite a community vibe and a sort mm. of a i would imagine in, when they aren't like you can't just pop the store as easily you might just be sharing more and what have you yeah what is the the scenario with the local people in that area is it a are people sort of do they do people stick to themselves do you uh, were you sort of intimate intimately related in terms of day-to-day -day life with the the local community there or how did that mm. work in you know yeah I think because my father's uh, role in the community, everybody sort of knew him, but uh, so thus everybody knew us uh, mm. as you know, a child. But in saying that as well, this most of the the communities that I've either lived on and in or visited, because we you know often you would play sports against other communities, and I played in a local girls softball team. Um, it, everybody kind of just shared. You, you touched on you know sharing things. There is no mine in 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 the communities that I were was a part of in our, mm -hmm. our First Nations, our First Peoples. But any if somebody has something, they bring it to the community, and it's for the benefit mm -hmm. of the community. And mm -hmm. and I remember when I first moved there um, to the to the outback, the first I think it was ten to start with, and and this was very foreign to me because it always been your things, your brother's mine, things, mine, mine. and you have to. Yeah, yeah, and you have to ask, you have to share, and it was always a big deal to have to borrow and share. And um, but then I, I moved there, and someone I remember one girl took one of my records. I had it was those are the days of vinyl. <laughs> um, took one of my records, and and I was like, oh. And then I, it took me a little while because as a child you don't see these things straight away. But then I worked it out that oh, I had something that was valuable for everybody. 
So oh, yeah. it was then shared amongst the community. I never saw that record again, but that's all right. It didn't matter. Um, yeah. I, I understood then after that when my mother explained that to me that, oh, I had something which would be beneficial to others. Of course it should be shared. Yeah, that's so cool. And, and did mm. you ever like have the feeling of, say, isolation growing up there? I mean, it sounds like you didn't because of the whole community spirit, but, mm. you know, I can't imagine there was thousands of people around. Did it? How, how did you find that? Pretty small communities. I, I wasn't too worried about the number of people in the community. That wasn't isolating to me at all. Um, it's, I mean, how many people do you spend time with socially? Who are your, your closest, dearest friends? There's only really a handful, aren't there? So mm. it doesn't matter where you phys- physically are. Um, and as a, as a child, you tend to make friends pretty quickly yeah. or either that or you isolate yourself and that's your, your chosen to do that. Um, and I was studying by correspondence up there. So the school would mail me the work. I would teach myself from books and then mail it back. And so there was quite a bit of time where I was quite isolated during my school time but then I'd be out mixing and socialising with others. Um, the only sort of isolation I guess I really felt, because I, I loved living out in that area, uh, was more about um, not seeing people who were like me in a different way. I, I'm, um, I'm a, a gay woman and I always knew I was uh, I, that I liked girls ever since I was a very young girl. I knew this from primary school. I just didn't know anybody else in the world like me. And so to then go into an extra, very remote location and to not see anybody else who looked like me in that way, I mm. couldn't see myself. You know where they say you, you need to see it to be it? I couldn't see myself. Mm. And so um, I, I felt very isolated from that from when it came to my sexuality. Um, mm. But, you know, eventually I, I came down to Melbourne to boarding school and, um, and, and met other people and, and realized that there were others out in the, like me in the world. I wasn't the only human <laughs> person. Um, yeah. But as a child, it's, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I um, was able to deal with that quite well. Um, I, I know many other people who've had a lot of struggles with coming mm. out when they were younger. I was just very confident and knew that that's who I was. I just never told anyone about it. It didn't mean that wasn't part of who I was. It just it was. Um, yeah. But yes, that was that was pretty isolating, I think, um, and not something I've, I've really spoken much about before. Um, but I do remember when I finally met other gay women. And it wasn't until I was about um, 18, 19, and yeah, I thought, oh, wow, look at this! Oh my gosh, there's lots of us out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and what's it what's it like uh, having a a twin brother like that's you know that's obviously not a common thing like you know having a twin is not, is often sort of you know someone who's the same sex but a twin brother as well how was that? Mm. Oh, I'm so fortunate. Um, I'm I'm pretty close to my twin brother. We might live in different states, uh, but it doesn't mean we don't have special connection. And I think that. A lot of those um, uh, stories that you hear about twins knowing what each other's doing or feeling what each other has is been in pain or something like that. We had we had that as well growing up, and um, and I still have elements of that too these days when something's terribly wrong. I just know and I, I give Dave a call and you know see how he's going and and so forth. So it's um, mum has lots of funny stories about that when I was when we were little about what what. David's over doing that. So I was dobbing on David for doing something that I had no clue that he could have been doing. So I used my powers for evil at that time instead of good. It it's like witchcraft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One to twin powers. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, and obviously, so it was the two of you and, and, and dad. And then, so did you, did dad sort of stay up, uh, in uh, the Northern Territories and then you went down back to, for school or did you all as a family move back to, to Melbourne? Yeah, we all ended up moving back to Melbourne uh, around the time when myself and my twin brother were finishing high school. Um, so our last year, year 12, and uh, it just seemed, you know, it, it, with all the different things that kind of happen in life, sometimes something acts as a lever and it just seemed a time for the family to sure. move down. So. Um, I have uh, two other brothers as well, and so my mum, dad, and my, me and my three bros, we all came down to Melbourne and um, started life started life back there, back with the the other family, extended family there. Yeah, that's mm. that's, that's really cool. So just just to touch on the education part that you mentioned mm. earlier on, so basically, 
you all, I'm assuming, studied via correspondence. And mm-hmm. how, how did you find that? So did you actually not go to school? You all had to, like, I guess, homeschool yourselves. And, and did your folks help yeah. you? What's the sort of path of that? How does it work? Because it's very interesting. I think, like, right now, education is kind of like, oh, it's like, what's going on? How do we teach, um, mm-hmm. you know, the future and, you know, future sort of generations? So, you know, what mm-hmm. was it like for you? Um, well, I did correspondence for the first few years. And then for the last couple of years, mum and dad sent my twin brother and I down to boarding school in Melbourne because they realized it's probably time we learned how to socialize with other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially getting ready to, if we wanted to go to university, you know, they wanted us to finish um, at a school and ensure we had all of the facilities available to us. But um, for me, I I guess maybe this is why the PhD element and being dedicated and diligent about stuff is not too difficult except for standard interruptions to life occasionally um Mm. i was like that as a child um when i received the packages of books and science kits and that was cool studying science correspondence it's mario these awesome kits and you get to play with stuff it was cool (laughs) (laughs) there was the required experiments and then there was the dave and die experiments (laughs) different games um so i would just sit in my room and do my my study, my schoolwork. I'd look, go through my, my German. Um, I'd do my English, my maths, whatever else, and uh, and do the assignments and uh, mail them back to the teachers in Adelaide. And then they'd mail me back my assignment results. Um, and that's kind of how I taught myself. Uh, my parents helped a little bit with the with the science stuff. I think that was more. It was probably just keeping an eye on us to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no fume cupboards so here, like <laughs> not blowing up the house. <laughs> no, we just did a spare room. <laughs> did you mention uh, so German? Yes, I spoke. I learned to speak some German when I was a child, oh, and cool. uh, and then when I finished school, I went and studied um, some French, which was ha- handy because I ended up living and working in Belgium for um, about a year and a half. So um, being able to speak and, and understand French, although I wasn't fluent like like obviously we are in English here, um, I could comfortably live there and, and read my bills <laughs> and yeah. converse at the shopping centre and things like that. So, um, But yeah, German was the first language I learned other than English. Mm. Oh, interesting. And are you still, can you still converse a little bit in it? Oh, that's a bit harder. That one I can I can converse more in French than I can in German. I although I can understand it. Uh, I guess it's like anything. It's a it's yeah. the audio. You the audio for me is is much more powerful. It takes yeah. me a while for the mind to come back into oh it's that phrase um, and then say it. Um, but my I think my pronunciation like that the sounds that come out uh, are, are pretty good comparatively. Um, considering I haven't spoken it for so many years, but when I do speak it, I, I don't sound like a complete Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I can be understood. So, so, you've, so obviously you're growing up, I mean, it's quite a diverse upbringing and mm-hmm. I, I guess uh, I guess it kind of lends itself to an interesting, you know, adulthood and, and you've obviously, you've got quite a wide range of interests and you do a lot of, experimentation these days still and which I'd love to get into mm. uh, in a bit but um, what was what would you say in your youth was something that sort of piqued your interest in in the sciences and maybe more specifically space and exploration and that kind of thing mm. and, and what sort of led you on this pathway to um, Mars One which we'll get into in a bit. Yeah I think that that end of the 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 rainbow has been quite serendipitous more than anything. Um, I mean, my passion for for space and science, I think, came from my father predominantly. He was an avid science fiction reader. He, he had a massive library of, of books. And, and when you live in the outback um, and don't have a TV, you read a lot wow. of books. So I devoured my father's science fiction library and and. But younger, when I was younger, before we moved to the Outback, um, my father took me to see the very first Star Wars movie, and that was very, 
form it was very powerful to me. I remember seeing that it was I think it was released the same year as Greece was released. Also a very yeah. powerful movie for me. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different. But, <laughs> but, I, but I guess as a child when you know my world was so immersed with this um, fantasy but also fiction. We know that so many of the great science fiction writers, if we look at you know, they're, they're almost prophetic um, thoughts about what the future could bring. Many of those things have occurred so, in mm. some instances. So that's, um, I, I sort of always thought that it was possible to go to space. It, it wasn't it, it wasn't impossible. Our, our future was in space because I've, I'd been reading about it since I was a young child. Of course we were going to be in space. Um, and, I, of course, I, I assumed I would get to do that. And But I had never thought about being an astronaut or applying to be an astronaut because we don't have a space program here in Australia. So, you know, it's not it's not as if we have a NASA here in our backyard. There's, there is no um, Australian space. Well, oh, that's changing, so that's good. Um, but we don't still don't have any astronaut programs here. So, um, But the, the Mars One stuff sort of, it just came out of left field. But it, it didn't, it didn't. I think when you map almost like the constellation of, your journeys through life or the different things you've had the chance to do or or lessons you've learned or skills you've acquired or people you've met, some things connect and then you see this extraordinary map that's led you down to something you never thought you'd get to. Um, and, and that's kind of what Mars One was for me, that all of the, the things I've learned uh, from my time in government when I um, worked in energy sector and uh, um, the stuff I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for uh, for about 12 years, a number of different areas of, of human physical health uh, and, and emotional health too. Um, and, and then all the stuff I did with not-for-profits over these and, and just the skills I've acquired personally as well um, actually equipped me to be someone who's quite a good generalist mm. for so many, so many of the things that we'll need to survive and, and thrive on Mars. And um, so then when it came up, when I saw the ad, it... Um, I didn't feel held back because I wasn't oh. a qualified astronaut <laughs> yeah. or something like that. I thought it was possible. Why not? Yeah. So when you saw the ad, were you, were you, was it like literally like you were reading something random and you were like, oh, look at this. And then you were like, <laughs> I want to do that. Was it like that or was it? You know? It was a bit like that. Actually. Um, I was at a, a good friend's place and uh, who I used to catch up with uh, regularly. About once a month would have a um, cook a marvelous meal together and, and would flip through cooking magazines and all sorts of stuff and just eat great food. And um, and, and she, I don't think she mentioned to me, but I was sitting on her sofa looking at something on my iPad and then I saw a, um, a, a science blog because I, I follow all sorts of different people um, <laughs> and random things. You never know. You just get, it's about um, filling the bucket, isn't it? You've got yeah. to have a bucket empty yeah. to let things come into it and then things bubble to the top. Um so that was, I remember seeing this, this email and one of the headline pieces was something along the lines of astronauts wanted for one-way trip to Mars. And, and <laughs> from, right, it was complete clickbait for me. I thought, well, <laughs> what, it, what is this? For me, it was about the possibility. You know, I, I could, I'd had all those dreams and fantasies as a child about doing something incredible like flying in space, but... Um, here was something which anybody could apply for. There was nothing holding you back from applying at all. Um, so anybody could apply. So, But then what could we be? I started thinking about what life on Mars could be like and what, how would that affect us as a species? What would, we have to, what would we have to become to be able to look after each other on another planet? We really, really, truly have to be able to help each other to survive. It won't be a case of... Here, here's your stuff, here's my stuff, let's borrow. That, that whole element of, of sharing of that, that our First Nations people uh, have so strongly in their communities um, really comes to the fore because there is only one community and, and survival of the community is going to be reliant on every single one of those people in that community. Um, so I thought it was fascinating. And, and from the, the personal perspective, I'm really interested in sustainability. So I was incredibly curious to think about how could we live sustainably on Mars? Because I understood that under the Outer Space Treaty and, and various other elements of space law and, um, and how we can do research and so on in space, that we can't damage or cross-contaminate with another celestial body, i.e. another planet. Uh, mm. And I thought, wow, that means we can't, we can't just dig a hole in the backyard in Mars and dump waste. We can't have waste can no longer exist. 
How fantastic! Wow. Just imagine that all of the, and all of that would have to develop it and plan it and test it here on this planet first. So if we have to live like that on Mars, then it allows us to do so here on Earth too. Wow. But without such leverage, without having to, that necessity being the driver of invention, right, without having it being such a powerful lever, we don't make such big changes here on this planet. Yeah. It's incremental, isn't it? It's only when something really phenomenal happens that we see significant change usually. Yeah. Yes. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to um, yeah, just talk quickly a little bit about uh, the, the science fiction side of things because I remember mm. I always used to watch like, science fiction movies and go ah what a waste of time because it wasn't really like my interest but like over the Mm. years i've become much more interested in them because i almost think it's like they should some of them should be called science non-fiction because like you said they're they're actually things that end up happening Mm. and i almost have this theory that uh science fiction is uh, Hollywood or, or whoever else, maybe someone behind them preparing us for the future, like sort of subconsciously, you know, they're like, you know, we're going to call this science fiction, but actually this is what's going to happen. So, you know, we'll, we'll make you guys kind of think it's, it's something that, you know, um, out there, but it's, you know, it possibly is the future. And it seems to be with a lot mm. of the things that we watch. Um, like AI stuff, like stuff that's like representing artificial yeah. intelligence is yeah. big one, I, I reckon, uh, Gareth. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, oh. now just talking about the uh, growing stuff sustainably on Mars, um, I'm forgetting I'm forgetting the name of the movie, but it was quite a recent one um, with Mark Wahlberg when he goes and mm. he's stranded on, I think it's Mars, isn't it? And It's called The Martian, isn't it? It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, the Martian. Yeah, and then yeah, he... Yeah. Uh, Matt Damon. Matt Damon, yeah. sorry, 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 Matt yeah. Damon, yeah, yeah, and yes, he has yes. to start growing his own, like, yeah, uh, yeah. plants and things like that, and, and that's like, you know, you look at it and you're like, hey, this is ridiculous, but that's actually what's going to happen in 20 years' time, I mean. But you know what's really interesting, uh, Gareth, sorry for interrupting there, Dan, was that, that that was science fiction, but it also wasn't, because the writer of that book um, had to, like, do fairly well, not fairly, ridiculously complicated mathematics and equations to work out um, like the pressures of that, uh, what do you call it, like eco-sphere, I forget the word I'm looking for there. And it was, like you say, it's science fiction, but he actually went and did the calculations and and worked it all out, how much of X, Y, and Z they would need. And so his book was very accurate, actually, I think on, on some levels you know yeah it's kind of cool mm. very cool <laughs> yeah definitely and there are definitely and there are as well as the the science fact elements that are in there which i think make for great lessons for for kids at school um for example like often i'm i'm fortunate enough to be invited to come and speak at schools occasionally and, and maybe do a science lesson or just a general talk about mars one or, or space or whatever and and sometimes i'll do a myth busting the martian session where <laughs> you know what is could this happen or what about this bit? And so and get the kids to talk about it and explore the science behind some of that. And that's fun because there's definitely some science fact, but there's a lot of science fiction too. It's, it's a movie. It's a movie. Of course. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> Are they little green men on Mars? That's what I would I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but actually, um, one of the things, if I'm fortunate enough to be um, selected in the final round of selection for the Mars One project, the, during the training, one of the, the things to be trained on is um, a, something called exobiology, which is the study of extraterrestrial biology. Um, and there is a, such a subject. How cool is that? Wow, so, man, and yes. the, the concept is so that we can identify what life might be like that may not be exactly what we expect. Um, I don't think we'll find little green men. <laughs> but right. but we, we may find something microbial, I suspect, that, that if we find anything, that's what it's most likely to be. Yeah. But that's going to be really tough, I'd imagine, because the fact that you're going to be there mm. means that there's contamination, I would imagine. Like, it must be quite hard to say this thing that we found mm. is, we can categorically say it's, it's um unless it's got some kind of strange DNA or something, I would imagine. But if it's just yeah. bacteria or something, it would be quite hard to to know if it's brought from Earth or, or what. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's where we're going to see uh, some of the technology such as drones mm. being used a lot more to allow mm. us to explore parts of the planet that otherwise we wouldn't be able to because of this concern for contamination. And uh, because there's a, a group called COSPAR who are the, the research guideline um, gurus that say this is what you can and can't do in space. And and they're the ones that each every couple of years they map out what are called exclusion zones on Mars, which are zones where we cannot go. Uh, and the main sort of things that are criteria there are usually that there's the potential for water and, of course, there's potential uh -huh. water, potential for life. And so that's about trying to protect both you know, any sort of native life um, from being contaminated from human life and vice yeah. versa we don't know so so they're out of bounds areas but that's where drones could go for example to Ooh. explore and i think nasa yeah. are looking at sending a drone up with one of their next missions to mars wow that's super interesting mm. it's almost mm. like a movie within itself isn't it it's like you know yeah. you, you're going up like like if, if you go up you know you you go up with a few people and you're not supposed to do this and that but then uh, there's some guy who's a bit more curious than others and he like right he's like no forget about it i'm tying you guys up and i'm gonna go check it out <laughs> no one can do anything <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's i don't cool. think you can go anywhere on your own there that's the problem is yeah, like you'll you just won't come back <laughs> <laughs> there'll definitely be some limitations in the early years definitely um yeah. how far someone will be able to travel away from the from the habitat yeah so you were mentioning earlier um a little bit about sustainability um on mm. mars and on earth uh you've obviously mm -hmm. that's a sort of a special interest of yours uh personally but obviously um for the bigger picture as well uh, i think it's a subject that gareth and i were just chatting earlier about it that we you know find really uh, interesting and can get can get quite heated because I think it's uh, you know waste and sustainability mm. all these things tie into one another. Tell us a little bit about some of the experiments and some of the projects that you've been involved with that involve uh, yeah both aspects the sustainability side of it and uh, yeah and uh, from there. There's a couple I've uh, I've done that were more sort of social experiments that I shared with with people. Um, my, my my research. Uh, my PhD is in environmental engineering, looking specifically at food waste. And my last two degrees prior to that, uh, one was in um, environmental management and the other in sustainable practice. So um, about systems thinking for for solving, you know, these sort of environmental issues. And uh, when I decided to try and live um, for a whole year last year without bringing any single-use plastic into the house, so just to think about the effect that plastic is, I mean, it's, it, plastic's a fantastic thing. It, plastic really has been one of the things in modern society. Uh, we have um, sanitized, you know, healthcare systems and so forth because of the ability to, to simply um, you know, manage things in plastic very easily and lightweight, to protect things, et cetera. So a lot of, a lot of benefits in plastic, but do we need as much of it as we do? I mean, every single piece of plastic that's ever been made still exists today. Yes, that's <laughs> crazy exists. to think about. Yeah. Even if it's now in tiny little particles like this, which are consumed by fish or <laughs> turtles or something, um, exists. Uh, so I thought, well, just as an experiment for myself, I want to see could I survive today, or well, survive, but how easy would it be to just live in the modern plastic world without bringing that into my life? Um, and how can I control other people giving it to me? That's a difficult bit. You can often control your own environment. Um, you can really lock yourself in, um, but it's harder when you have to interact with others. So um, that was everything from you know buying food um, to um, health healthcare and choices there. Um, um, uh, even even your bathroom products. I mean, you think about the first hour or two hours in the morning. How many times do you touch plastic? Everything Jeez. from brushing your teeth to making a cup of coffee, to um, your, your breakfast. I don't know what you guys eat, but um, I'm sure most people could tick off at least a dozen pieces of plastic they've touched before they even leave the house. Uh, and so to live an entire year without doing that was, uh, was an interesting experiment, very interesting. Um, I, I was most challenged by, I think, um, I think having to be creative. I had to actually, I had to be, I found it fun. Uh, it's challenging but fun. Like when when my toothpaste ran out, for example, 
um, thought, oh, what do I do now? Uh, how do I brush my teeth? And so then I found <laughs> recipes for that I could make my own toothpaste oh, wow. out of coconut, coconut oil and maybe some charcoal and, uh, and some peppermint oil. Uh, and ta-da, you've got toothpaste. And okay, it doesn't froth up, but that's really just marketing stuff anyway, yeah, making yeah. you feel like your mouth's clean. Um, so that was, you know, so little things like that, I had to work out, I had to problem solve. Wow. What do I do? I don't have this thing anymore. Can I make something or find an alternative or whatever? Um, and the most, I think the most difficult thing was accepting things from other people um, when I was not wanting plastic, uh, like mm. packaging, for example, things came, things, if someone's mailed you something, it's invariably in a plastic bag or it's got sticky tape on it. Or so I made yeah. a, I made a rule for myself. If I receive something that I had, I just couldn't avoid because I didn't know it was yeah. coming. Um, I had to find a second purpose for that bit of plastic. That was, wow. that was my thing. So yeah, so I had to really put the creativity hat on there. <laughs> yeah, but, but 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 like, I'd like to go into that a little bit more because I almost think it's nearly impossible to do. So if you okay, in my in my my scenario, right? I wake up in the morning, mm-hmm. um, I make uh, you know I have some water, then you know whatever exercise, and then uh, I'll I'll make some coffee, right? And uh, and then. My, my breakfast is oats. Oats always comes in plastic. Um, and then brushing your teeth, like you said, putting facial cream on. Uh, even your toothbrush is, I guess, some form of plastic, you know, like the, what it's kind of made of. How, how do you eliminate those things? Like what your breakfast, mm. what your breakfast comes in? Do you, yep. do you change well, completely what you eat? Yeah, some of it was yeah. that. I, because I removed all packaging, um, it, it meant that there were only a couple of aisles in the supermarkets that I shopped. So was, I didn't go to supermarkets as much because there was no point. Yeah. Almost everything's in plastic. Um, but when it came to trying to buy things that, like for example, your oats, there I'm fortunate enough in the, the cities that I've lived in or towns, there are places that will often sell whole foods. And you can go and bring your own containers or even they have yeah. paper bags and you can fill as much as you need in there and you buy by weight. So I would, if I wanted something, say coconut flour, for example, um, I would go to a whole food store, whole foods store, say that quickly, whole food store <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and just get the amount that I wanted in a paper bag. And then I would, just because I was so in the habit of it, I then reused that paper bag the next time. Good it stuff. was still fine. I yeah. know it's recyclable, but... It still used energy. It uses energy to recycle and energy to make it. So, why not give it a second life, a third life, a fourth life until it actually has got a hole in it? Um, so yeah, so recycle I did that with, in your own home. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? It's, Repurpose, <laughs> recycle. That's so cool. Absolutely. Um, and the, I think the, I found myself cooking a lot more from scratch too. So I'd go to markets or grocery stores and and buy um, the veg and the the meat or whatever else and. Um, and then just cook it all fresh myself, um, learn to make my own mayonnaise, um, things like that. Um, but I'll just do it and keep it in a jar, a glass jar wow. with a metal lid. Um, so just little things like that. I'll bring my own containers to the butchers yeah. and say, could you please fill this with a kilogram of mints, you know, stuff like that. And, and how much of that sort of experimentation has now become a habit in your life? Oh, uh, that's I still today bring my own containers to the butchers. Like today, I went and picked up a, um, one and a half kilograms of goat mince at the Queen Victoria markets here in the city in in Melbourne. Passed the guy in my tub, filled it up, gave it back to me. I mean, they weigh they weigh the meat, so they just put the container on first and te- tear that, uh, yeah, and man. then just put the meat in. So it's it's no different to them than shoving it in a plastic bag. It's just I'm giving them a container instead. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so it yeah. really is good. wow. Here on the go. Yeah, I just just the toothpaste part. So like, do you, do you still mm. make your own toothpaste? Yeah, it depends on most of the time. Yeah, so in the um, in the bathroom here, there's um, the jar with the the coconut oil. It's just there, um, and I find it it's not as abrasive um, on the teeth as well. I've just got used to using it. There is the the standard little um, tube of toothpaste that I have when I'm travelling. Um, now, which is just, I think it'll probably end up lasting me years. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> it, uh, um, so, but also toothbrushes. There are bamboo toothbrushes around. Mm. The bristles are also bamboo, and you buy them in a cardboard uh, box. 
So um, to, it's being aware that there are other product options out there, uh, and that's what I you know had to work out. What can I do here? And in fact, if you don't mind me, I'm going to I'm going to broach a topic that I often don't talk about with gentlemen, um, <laughs> but that's when it's when it's that time of the month for ladies. Yeah. It's an mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a period of yeah. the month mm-hmm. when we often <laughs> will use things that are disposable. So yeah. tampons are wrapped in plastic. People use pads that yeah. are throw away things that are plastic lined and so forth. So plastic, 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 uh, mm. and and so that was that was one of the first things that really confronted me. It's like, oh hello, yeah. I've got to deal with this <laughs> once a month. How do I yeah. deal with this? Yeah. But then I thought, well, plastic's only been in our lives for this long, and versus how long humanity been in existence, yeah. like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. So I thought, well, what? What did people used to do and what are the other options available? Uh, yeah. And so, you know, when I researched that, I found there were other ways of, of uh, dealing with that in a hygienic fashion, yeah. uh, but not yeah. using plastic. That was great. Oh, that's really cool. I, I think, yeah. uh, like, all of those are so, so important. I think one thing that you mentioned there that made me think of is you, you, you become more frugal as well, like, just mm. with with your usage of everything. It's like, it, it's, not, it's not just... It's not just the fact of the plastic, but it's also like this yeah. awareness that that it has to be thrown away when it's done. So be mm. a bit sparing, use it properly, and that's another sort of a wrinkle to that that's really really important. So what what for our listeners, I think it's a massive subject. I think plastics, uh, it's a massive thing. Like we were we were, I was in Bali recently, and the the mm. beaches were just full of plastic. And um, I was saying to Gareth earlier, you know. You go for breakfast, and there's like twenty little butters in a, each one in a tiny little plastic mm. thing. There's freaking plastic everywhere, yeah. and but then you see it on the beaches. Like uh, the re- the reason I'm saying it is because it's a bit more confronting. You realize, okay, mm. generally speaking, I'd eat that little butter and throw it away, but there you eat, throw the butter butter away, and then you're like, oh wow, that, it feels like it's on the beach now, and it's almost yeah. more like in your face. But what is yeah. the what is a solution or what is an easy, what is the single best thing that we can do to start reducing our plastic intake of sort of the general person on the street? Do you, do you have any advice for, for us there? Gosh, I think, I think if you touched on a point that's really valid, which is that whole, you know, you feel like you're throwing it straight on the beach because there, there is no such thing as a way. There is no a way. We're just mm. putting it in another place. So it's, there's no a way. Um, and I guess, it's hard to know where to start when so much of our life is full of plastic. Um, I, I would probably, and what I, I guess I just threw myself into it. Let's just go mm. whole hog. Um, but if someone was looking to just make, you know, one little change, because it's mm. what do we say? It's what eighty-five. If you're trying to change one behaviour, you've got a much, you've got like an eighty-five percent chance of actually being successful in it. Whereas if you try and change two or three, yeah. it just decreases so dramatically sure. very quickly. Um, so that one little thing. To identify what they are first is what I'd probably say. Mm. Maybe do a maybe do a um, a plastic audit for yourself. Like one day, you know, nine to five or whatever it is, what t- whatever time you get up in the morning to whatever time you go into bed at night, sort of list all of the things that are plastic and maybe just try a week where you don't use one of them or yeah. two of them or or replace it with something else. So it's just that mindfulness, that consciousness of this is the one thing I'm focusing on. Um, and I know in July, they have something called Plastic Free July here in Australia. I think it's worldwide now um, where there's lots of other things that people can start to. There's lots of tips and tricks you can use, like, you know, say no straws or oh, um, cool, yeah. you know, things like that. The straws are a good one. Bring your own shopping bags when you go shopping, little yeah. things like that. Uh, and in Australia now, um, a lot of the states are moving to ban the plastic bag. So you won't be able to get plastic bags in grocery stores um, very soon, um, which good. is great. So, I mean, there's yeah. so many of them. And and I hear people sometimes arguing, but what will I line my bin with? <laughs> yeah. That we didn't always have these things. We would wash the bin <laughs> in the past. And yeah. and if you actually, and if I can move to my other world of waste, which is food waste, if you take the food waste out of the bin, if you don't put food waste in the bin, the bin's not going to smell. Yeah. Yeah, you won't sure. need to wash it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can we just like just talk a bit about maybe types of plastic? Because I'm like a mm. massive uh, recycler, and yeah, I'll you know I'll most of my most of my stuff it goes into the recycle bin. But what I find right. 
is when I look at a lot of the packaging, even though it's plastic, and and uh, I'll and a lot of organic stuff too, which is even worse. Like their stuff is not mm. recyclable. You know, like what? what right. So so what is this? Mm. So, so for, I, I mean, I don't want to load with, with too many questions, but you know, gosh. Um, yeah, the 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 fact, or well, the first of all, the fact that that you're getting organic food and it's not in recyclable uh, plastic is annoying. Yeah. But I guess maybe that, just, that just kills yeah, me, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But just but just um, the, maybe the different types of plastic and why one is recyclable and one is not. Do you do you know much about Most, that? Um, I'm not an expert in this area. Um, okay. I understand that uh, there are a lot of different sorts of um, processes that are used to. To break down the different types of um, petrochemicals yeah. that are, that make up our plastics, and not all of the so in Australia, it's councils that usually collect the recycling. I don't know what it is where S- you guys same, are. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, so and not all councils will allow recycling of the same plastics. There'll be types one, two, three, etc., and so on. But they're not all going to be accepted. And a lot of that is due to the infrastructure that they have in processing it. So that's really often the limiting factor there is the processing of it and then what it can be used for to produce another product. Is there a market for that? Um, But I've noticed a lot of the supermarkets now are starting to accept um, any sort of plastic. In You can actually take old plastic bags or, or random bits of plastic and and take them to the supermarket and they, and they collect them there for repurposing. They'll make um, like uh, outdoor park benches and so forth out of them. So, yeah. um, so That's cool. uh, but they're not, it's not well known. Uh, I don't think people realize that they can do that. Uh, but yeah, most, it, it really does depend upon the, the type of plastic itself and what facilities are there to be able to break it down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. While you're talking about these kind of things, you mentioned the food waste, and and uh, mm-hmm. I think it's a good, probably a good time to to get onto that that subject as well. Um, you've done, uh, you know, some experiments with that as well, and <laughs> I uh, you know, it's it's actually quite confronting when I first, you know, I've I've seen other people in the past do similar things and discuss it, and but it's really confronting the thought of how much is thrown away. Uh, generally speaking, and uh, I don't think people, I don't think myself included, quite get how much is thrown away from supermarkets. And and, and so, can you just give us a little bit of an intro into what sort of what you know, watch my waste, and was all about, and and what is mm. food waste? Mm. Um, so, watch my waste is the brand name I gave to my PhD research, and which is. Uh, consists of a, a few different research projects to try and determine how much food is wasted in the hospitality sector predominantly um, and why that occurs and and test a particular intervention to see if we do this can it change um, so that's what uh, that's what I wanted to do and uh, food waste itself what is well it's really subjective you know people often use all of these qualifications of um, unavoidable and avoidable and uh, and whether it's you know food wastage or food loss and all of this but essentially it's a subjective thing we consider something a waste if it is of a lesser value than its original functional purpose don't we we you know, think about the plastic it's been used now now it's a waste product I've taken mm-hmm. its function out of it I've had the drink I've used the whatever it was just the vessel for the drink I, the drink's gone this vessel is less value um same thing with food in many instances if people have have got their value out of whatever the food is whatever's left probably has less value because they've already achieved what they wanted out of it whether it was a lovely night out whether it was as in for the diner whether it was in the kitchen because they've trimmed the the tuna to make the perfect shaped sushi um they've got what they wanted out of it don't worry about the trimmings um so that sort of stuff happens all the time uh and and so that value element, and also there's the cultural element too of what is waste and um, what someone, it's that whole thing, you know, one man's waste is another man's treasure or mm. whatever, trash and treasure. Um, some cultures, what, uh, what we consider waste, others consider food. Uh, for example, they often um, talk about avocados and uh, about 70% of the antioxidants, or oh, sorry, the oils of the avocado is actually in the seed. 
and mm. uh, so it's it's very very nutrient dense part of the of the the fruit avocado is a fruit, um, and so you know we don't eat that in most Western nations, but it's part of some traditional Mexican dishes. It gets dried and ground up and put through various dishes. So um, you know just because we throw the pivot away doesn't mean someone else will. Um, I know a chef uh, through my research that chose not to cook the broccoli stems in with the heads when he was making broccoli soup because it changed the color of the soup and he wanted a particular color of green. Yeah. Wow. So that other bit didn't serve function. So it depends on its 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 value once again and what we what we're trying to achieve with the food. Is it social connection? Is it just nutrition? Uh, what what's it what's the purpose of it? Uh, and then how do you feel about it? Um, there's research that suggests that people are much more anxious about losing social face than they are about the mm. disappointment of wasting food. So they'll feel almost like a, a grief or disappointment about wasting the food, but they're much more worried about what others might think of them for asking for a doggy bag. So yeah, ridiculous, yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah crazy. I know, I know. It's just nuts. Um, but it's social pressure, really, really powerful thing, uh, and it can be done so easily. I mean, if a if a restaurant, as the as the the waiters were clearing the table, if they automatically just said, "Would you like me to put that in a box for you to take home?" They've just normalised that as this is standard behaviour. Yeah. It's okay for you to have that. Yeah. Um, versus you being a person who goes, oh, can I have the... You know, yeah, so you yeah, don't totally. have to be the person that tries to initiate the discussion. It should be done by the restaurant. Dining out is like theatre, really. I mean, the whole thing is theatrical <laughs> experience. We're waiting for the script. We're waiting for the script from yeah. the, the service people to tell wow. us what we should be eating or not eating or whatever. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I think it's it's so interesting because, well, a couple of things, you know, and, uh, you know, we don't have to go down this path, but like, I think, is it social pressure or is it just self-confidence? You know, like whatever, like, you know, if you don't actually care, you're like, you're going to ask for it all the time. So, you know, that's, that's one like, way, I mm. guess, of looking at it. But also, I guess, yeah. like, cult culturally, um, it can differ too. So like in South Africa, it was like, everyone mm. asked for doggy bags. <laughs> like, seriously, it was like, you, know, mm. you if you didn't come home with a doggy bag it was weird so there wasn't that pressure at all you know <laughs> what i mean like almost you almost yeah, look yeah, forward yeah. to getting a doggy bag because it always tastes better the next day you know what i mean yeah <laughs> absolutely. Um, and the u.s as well like the u.s it's a strong culture of doggy bags absolutely the size of the meals there are phenomenally yeah, large uh, when yeah. you dine out most of the time but it's standard to say, yeah, can you just put half of that in a box for me to go straight away so I don't even you know, need to see it on the plate? It's not unusual for that to happen at all. And people often will take their food home. Whereas in Australia, it's almost a, a cultural cringe. Wow. We were not as affected in Australia by the GFC. And I think that the affluence here in this country, people want to show that they're affluent as well by leaving food. <laughs> I don't need, don't need to finish this. I can afford to leave it behind. Uh, sometimes what you leave behind is the stuff that you're not going to reheat anyway. Is it, I mean, chips or yeah. something, that, something that's not good. It doesn't have much value when it's in its next you know, life um, <laughs> as your, your tom tomorrow's lunch. Uh, whereas, you know, your piece of pizza is fine the next day or, or maybe a salad is still fantastic. All these sorts of things are still great. But chips the next day, yeah, that's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even when you reheat them it's not quite the same is it? oh yeah so i ran this experiment at the start of the year um that i wanted to show that i could live off food waste for a whole week uh and that not just food waste i wasn't dumpster diving or or whatever um i was what i did was i decided to only eat the food that had been left by other diners at restaurants cafes pubs um, catered events and so on so only in the hospitality sector uh, I decided to do this because I had um, presented some of my research at a conference late last year and just uh, at the start of the year submitted some of my data for publication to a, an academic journal and so but people don't read that stuff people <laughs> people don't read they don't read charts and graphs and things like that in academic journals and I thought how can I how can I illustrate some of this information in a way that is memorable. So I thought if I did this and and made sure like I had no no condiments from home, I couldn't 
um, eat anything from home or drink anything from home except for water. Um, so I really restricted myself, everything, all my coffee, everything I had to scavenge off people's plates, uh, you know, who just finished dining. And it was very interesting because uh, I knew <laughs> sounds like most people go, oh, when they first hear yeah. about it. Because I'm eating, I'm eating you know, leftovers essentially. But we do this all the time at home. Don't we share our food at home? I know, yeah. you know growing up with brothers, it was a case of if you didn't finish it, your, bro- your brother was going to. Yeah. If you yeah. finish with that, I've got, I'll have that if you don't want that. Yeah. Um, so, but why don't we do that with other people? We might do it with our friends sometimes. Oh, did you want a taste of my fish? It's really lovely. But do we? Just, <laughs> yeah. What about a ran, what about a what about a random stranger? Yeah. Why not? No. So anyway, that that's usually the ick factor of the random stranger that mm. uh, most people freak out a bit. Um, but I knew I, because of my research, I knew what sorts of venues um, would be wasting food or what what sort of time of day is going to be better to get it, what sorts of diners are more likely to leave it. Um, so the cuisine type, like I, I knew I'd be able to eat. I knew there were no problems with that. In fact, I I'd walked away from so many meals. I didn't need to. I could pick and choose wow. what I wanted to eat, wow. sadly. Um, although I did eat a lot of chips. Uh, <laughs> people, people leave the chips. Well, it's because restaurants put put excess chips on the plates as plate fillers. Yeah, yeah. You know, they put this this much meat and this much quality vegetable and then these big pile of chips. Um, because the keto my- diet went out the window there, I'd imagine. Oh, it did. <laughs> I went out of ketosis like that. It was horrendous. Oh. Uh, the first couple of days wasn't too bad. It was like, oh, it's all right, it's all right. Um, but then after about day three, nah, not happy, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't actually, in fact, my mental health really changed. And my partner said that she could see as the week progressed that the more grains I was consuming, the more I became a bit negative, a bit grumpy, wow. more emotional. Yeah, so That's I mean, really I know that the gut, the gut health plays a huge role in in mental health. You know, ninety five percent of our serotonin is produced in the gut. You know, um, and the signals from gut to brain, um, most of it goes from the gut to the brain. So it's it's t- no brainer, literally. <laughs> um, but I. And I, and I know because I have good practice, mental health practice by, you know, meditation and journaling and gratitude journaling and all this sort of stuff. But I had not seen such a marked change in my mental health from one thing um, for, I, I don't think ever. So I knew yeah. that, okay, I can't wait for this week to be over. I can't wow. bring on the fat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so can we just talk about, I guess, the psychology around it? Because... It's mm. it, and and the sort of social kind of awkwardness maybe, you know. You sit yeah. down. I don't know. Say I don't know if you went to McDonald's or, or wherever the places you were going. Because I mean, we, I watched it. I was super interested in like all your Instagram stories and stuff. I was like, you, you know, this takes yeah. a, it takes a lot of guts to do it. I think you know. Never mind, <laughs> never mind the fact that you're eating like the um, the leftovers of other people's food. Just to actually put yourself in that position takes a lot of guts and confidence and and whatever else you kind of almost don't need to care about what people think you know because you i'm assuming like you mm. i don't know you know there must there's obviously different scenarios but you you know mm. you you're kind of like you're checking people out there at your table your <laughs> table's empty you know because all you want to do is you want to <laughs> get their leftovers the ground. yeah yeah, yeah exactly. totally yeah, like oh, there's, a, there's a good class who doesn't yeah there's a good victim <laughs> um but like or, or did you was it like a bit of that and then a bit of like asking people as well you know are you finished can i take yeah. it can you just explain that, that to us please yeah, look, it varied. Um, sometimes it was just fortune. Um, I'd be walking past a place, uh, like I remember one evening when I picked up um, a fantastic um, Greek meal, um, which is a majority of a spanakopita and some Greek salad and uh, and some tzatziki, and almost almost like half a plate of food. And, uh, and I, I was just carrying my own containers with me everywhere I went so I could just take it with me. Either that or I would sit down and just eat it where I was if it was that sort of food um, or drink it if it was coffee. Um, and I remember that one. It's like, oh, fantastic. So, just that, so that was just pure luck. Walk past almost a full plate. Thanks. I'll have that. And then just kept going. Um, so, so I just put it into my own container and walked off. Uh, but other times I would do exactly that. I remember one time I was sitting, um, I was down near a food court and and I saw a lot of people buy their coffee in takeaway cups but still sit at the venue 
to drink it. Why they don't want to drink it in a, a mug <laughs> or a glass. Coffee tastes vastly better out of a mug or a glass than it does in a paper cup with a plastic lid. Yeah. Let's not worry about the environment oh, there either. Yeah. But that's another story. <laughs> so, so the, what, the one billion coffee cups that Australians throw away every year from takeaways, it's crazy. And they, yeah. often they just sit there and drink them. Anyway, so it was very easy to, to suss out coffee. I'd, I'd walk past and, you know, just pick one up, give it a shake. Oh, yeah, it's still got some in it. I'll take that with me. Um, but one time I thought, oh, I just wouldn't mind sitting down for a while. So I, was, I saw near a cafe this guy was sitting down and he had a coffee next to him. I didn't think it was his. Wasn't sure. Eh, I'll ask. So I sat down next to him and I just asked him straight away, um, is, is this your coffee? Excuse me, is this your coffee? And he said, oh, no, it's not. I went, okay, thank you. So I just took it, took the lid off and just sat there and drank it. Um, and he didn't look. Didn't look, went back to his phone, doing what he was doing. <laughs> and just that's kind of, and in fact that's how it was in most instances. Most people didn't blink. Um, it's there's this thing called the spotlight effect yeah. where we often think that we're being observed and we're not. Yeah. Uh, in fact yeah. we think we're we the research suggests that we're being we think we're being observed about four times more than we actually are. Um, oh. and that's ample that that feeling of being observed is amplified even more if you're doing something which is slightly against what is considered the social norm. Yeah. So I felt oh. like the first few times Massive, I felt like everybody yeah. Everybody Jeez. around me was looking at me. Sure. But, but then I realized, no, they're not, Diane. Remember the spotlight effect. No one's noticing you except for the people who are coming to clean the table. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and they don't care. You've made their life easier. So. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you say anything to like them, like, guys, I'm going to be coming in here and just ta take in the, the, you know, or would you just kind of just go ahead and do it? I'll go ahead and do it. Um, in some instances, I'd have discussions with them to let them know what I was doing, like as I was doing it, saying, oh, do you yeah. mind if I take this? And I explain why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for research, for not for my research, but to illustrate something yeah. from my research. Social and experiment. Like. Yeah. Exactly. But I made sure that any time I put anything up on Instagram and, and so forth, that there was you couldn't identify where that particular product was from. Okay. Um, so that was you know part of the thing too. Because I, yeah. I have... A massive bank of photos and videos of things that I you know, collected that week, um, and I didn't. I don't want any companies to just yeah. because the diner decides, decides to leave it. It's not necessarily the business's fault. So sometimes yes. it's the diner just being greedy. Being greedy doesn't like it. There's a million reasons why you might leave something. Um, so, but it was. There was another time I went to a cafe. Um, I was sick of having ordinary coffee because most of the coffee was <laughs> I don't really drink drink milk, and most people that leave coffee leave milky coffee, yeah. usually yeah. with sugar. Oh. Neither, oh neither do I. I guess I neither of those things. So I thought I just want a long black. Someone please leave long black. But no, people who drink long black like their coffee. Drink it. Let's, let's take their time. Yeah. They finish their coffee. Um, so, uh, but one day I was walking past um, or nearby a cafe that I really like and used to go there myself in the past and I saw someone had left uh, a long black with about this much left in the bottom of the cup. Oh, I thought, Christmas. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I sat straight down in front of that cup and uh, and then the, the waiter came to clear, it had been a breakfast sitting, um, the waiter came to clear the, the plates and things from the diners that had been there previously. And then when he went to grab this the cup, which had the, the long black in it, I said, no, please, if you could leave that, please. And he just looked at me. And, uh, <laughs> that I don't think that's yours. I think that was from the people before you. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. He said, um, that, that drunk <laughs> from that. I went, yes, but from the other side, from the other side of the cup. Because <laughs> you can see if the cup has a handle on it, people drink from the same side. And you can see you can see the, the pathway of the, the fluid to the, the lip of the cup. So you yeah. can see if people have drunk out of one side or all sides or whatever. Um, so I knew. I didn't need to put my mouth where his or hers had been. Um, I could put it on the other side of the cup. Not yeah, too yeah. hard. So and when I explained to the guy then why I was doing it. I said, oh, this is why I want to finish this coffee here. Yeah. And and it's like, ah, wow. Yeah, yeah, you still didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it then, to his credit, yeah, strange. But then to his credit, what he did was bring out um, a couple of glasses for me and uh, and a jug of water, so that that's it looked cool. like oh, I was cool. a yeah, just a normal person sitting there having oh, coffee. How cool is that? Ah, that's cool. Oh, yeah. He could have brought that's you awesome. another coffee. That would have been really nice. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I often wonder. I got given a cup of tea um, one time from a, a cafe that um, the the person had walked away without the cup of tea, and um, and so I just grabbed that. 
um, after the, the woman said, oh, who wants a cup of tea? I said, oh, thanks. I'll take that. So a full cup of um, it was a herbal tea. But uh, I, and it made me think, I wonder how many times a day does that happen in a cafe? You've ordered multiple things. You've got the main thing you wanted. The coffee was just there while you're waiting for your sandwich to be made or something like that. Um, I wonder how many of those coffees just yeah. never end up never. being taken. Yeah. yeah. So you weren't enjoying the the milky coffee, but you were okay with the <laughs> lukewarm coffees. <laughs> I don't mind coffee. Cold coffee's okay, just not <laughs> milk and sugar. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people listening to that story, probably myself included. Uh, I like to blame it on everyone listening, but you know, I'm sure people would want to know: d- Did you get sick? Like, I, I'm wondering, like, oh, but you're mm-hmm. drinking everyone's, you know, maybe sick people out there, and you know what I mean? And did you get not, sick at all? I had not sick per se. Um, I knew that I was bloating a bit, like my stomach was a bit unhappy, but that's because of all the milk. Because I don't drink milk, I yeah. knew that my gut was not going to be fantastic. Right, yeah. um, so there was a there was a little extra gas around the place, shall we say, <laughs> that wasn't normally, and it's not normally sure. here. So, so yeah, so, um, so from that and also from all the grains too, and I've I already mentioned the mental health change. I think that's that was the biggest thing. That was the biggest thing. Yeah. That was the biggest thing, yeah. So I, could I do it again? I could. I wouldn't want to. Um, yeah. it, was, it was very hard to, to eat a healthy diet by eating people's leftovers. Healthy by what I... Yeah. by what I sure. normally constitute sure. health. So people people are on all sorts of different ways of eating yeah. um, and I'm not going to you know, judge what anyone else wants to eat. But the way I eat, um, this is not a way that I could eat sure. and, and be happy and healthy. Yeah. I was, I, was, I was just thinking like you could almost have added another dimension to to that experiment like and make it a real social experiment by, by say, dressing up like as if you were like homeless or you know what I mean? Mm. Like, like that would have really, that would have been interesting, yeah. wouldn't it? Because then I guess people would have kind of looked at you differently. You would have been treated differently oh, by the definitely. restaurants you went into. And isn't that, yeah. isn't that crazy? Like in a way <laughs> you can kind of get it in a way, in a way you can't because it's just you, they're just the same person really. It just, you would like yeah. look a little scruffy or something. And the food's yeah, exactly. done, stay done with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They would go, no, no, yeah, I'm sorry, you, you got to go, something like that. It would be interesting. And yet this is somebody that needs the food so much more than yeah. than that person who's left it. And me, who obviously, you know, I can you yeah. know, buy food and cook food at home. You know, I, I think that's just a almost a sin, really, that the number of people go hungry and there's so much food wasted. It's a, in Australia, we grow enough food to feed 60 million people. And yes. yet... I mean, our population, our population is 24 million. I mean, most of it's exported, of course, but there's still an excessively large amount that's wasted. They say about a third of all food grown is lost or wasted. Like 30% of bananas never leave the farm. Um, One in two potatoes, one in two, 50% of potatoes are wasted. 50%. Yeah. Crazy. But but Diane, this is How much land would you not have to clear to do that? It's crazy. Exactly. But this is not a, this is not something like that's uh, just, an Australian thing. This is a worldwide issue, and and it's quite a good sort of pathway into talking a bit about food waste. Um, and and I just want to like I'm sh- I'm sure you've heard of this guy. His name is Tristram Stewart. Um, yes. He actually I read this book like literally when it came out about nine years ago. On it, it's basically just so people that are listening is about food waste and just uncovering the sort of scandal. Not or not scandal, but just this, this sort of reality around food waste in the world and. Mm. And yeah, it talks in there like every single day in the world, we throw away enough food to feed the undernourished people uh, one and a half times. Um, Like, you know, and it's just incredible. So uh, that's purely, I guess, through a a few reasons. One, greed, we we just eat too much, uh, overconsumption. And legal legalities, you know, like around companies not able to give away food and things like that because they're scared mm. of getting sued. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, like the what, what you know, what uh, what are your sort of thoughts on food waste and like how we can resolve it <laughs> and, and what does the future of it kind of look like? Well, the future looks good, uh, and it will have to. <laughs> We've yeah. all all nations of the earth. Uh, that are in the UN have signed up to 
um, deliver on the sustainability goal 12.3, which says we have to reduce our food waste globally by 50% mm. by 2030. So we have to halve how much food wow. we waste. In yeah. 20, 2030, that's less than 13 years. Yeah. That's a lot of a lot of work to do. So that means that there's a lot of initiatives that are coming forward in Australia that has launched the National Food Waste Strategy late last year. Um, UK and Europe have been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, but, I mean, South Korea, global leaders almost in many areas of food waste management. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in food waste. So even though it's still frustrating to see it, and my research, um, the stuff I presented at a conference last year, um, where I said that about 29% of the people who go out to dinner will have left food the last time they went out, but 71% didn't. Yeah. So, so I don't think I think the issue is not necessarily one where it's always excess. Although there is in Australia the main reason we leave food because the portion sizes are too large um, when it comes to dining out. But a lot of it is, and you touched on it um, there, Gareth. It's that distribution aspect yeah. if we can improve how its food is redistributed in some way whether it's dealing with some of the legislative barriers or even its education people think that it's uh, that they can't uh, get a doggy bag in restaurants in australia they think it's illegal it's not it's absolutely not you own the food you you have bought the food as the diner it's yeah. your food yeah. you can do what you like with it you can take it home in your own bag for all, all they care yeah. um but people don't think that. They don't feel that they have the power to do that. You talked about power earlier. Um, there are fantastic organisations like Ozharvest, Second Bite, Fair Share uh, and Food Bank that redistribute still consumable food from supermarkets, catering, etc., to charities that feed people. So we, we have these things in existence, but they're not used well. Uh, there are so many businesses that don't even think that they've got enough waste that could actually be useful, which is not true because they don't realise that, okay, their tray of sandwiches is that are left. may not be worth driving five kilometres to pick up, but there's another business two doors down that has got another tray of sandwiches and another right. one. So, so it could be collected in a hub almost. So there's, there are much more efficient ways of, of doing this redistribution, uh, and I'd love to see a lot more of that happening, and I think it will be. This is just, I think, the start of something that we've seen dramatic changes in food waste around the world, and we've just been a bit slow here in Australia. Okay. Yeah, I love that. I I think I saw a really interesting little like a documentary uh, or a story about this guy that just it, it just irked him as well that people were just throw like the restaurants were just throwing uh, so much food away. And what he started to do was he would him um, he would go just as you know as a, as an individual he'd go to a restaurant. Uh, at the end of the shift or whatever and pick up what their waste and he'd go to four or five of those and he'd make it a little compost heap for himself uh, at home and he thought this is doing my little bit and then what he did was he just he did that more then he got a bigger then he got a truck and he went to restaurant to restaurant <laughs> and and then he bought a, a little uh, he actually bought a little warehouse um, and he's on his little bobcat and he's pushing all the food together and then he went and then he's got a now he's got a fleet of people doing this and he, and I, as far as I understand that it's just like he just does it and he's just credited that he's got this massive thing and he composts and he turns that food in, uh, into fertilizer for people's yeah. gardens and and it's just so cool like it just can start from something like that and it's mm. literally just from wasted food like there's so many creative ways like you said earlier creativity being mm. creative is where it's at and and then you can figure out mm. a way you know and like it's just exciting to see like individuals have, having an impact, you know, even if it's small, we can all do something, you know. Mm. I used to play a game with myself when I first started doing research in this area um, a number of years ago now. I think I started in 2012, so it feels like forever, um, about six years ago. And uh, when I'd be making something at, at home, if <clears throat> if any of the, the trimmings or, or whatever the veggies or whatever were that were starting to mound up a little bit and it looked like it was more than, you know, um, more than about a handful, it's like, okay, can I eat that was my game. And so then I'd start to research, what can I do with that? So I learned to make um, little veggie fritters uh, out of the, the outside of the pot of the broad bean. Because people, yeah. you know, the broad bean, they take the outside, then there's another pot, and then you finally get to the bean. But there's other bits are potentially edible too. Yeah. We wow. don't. We throw, we throw them away. Yeah. So, so I started doing this sort of stuff. And so um, eggshells as well. Yeah. Why take a calcium supplement when eggshells have got uh, enough calcium for your daily needs? So 
yeah, it's there are solutions to to yeah. many problems by uh, um, by actually using that waste more intelligently. And how do you do that to the eggshells? Do you kind of grind them up and just like pour them over something like you know? But yeah, I'm sure they have to be quite yeah. fine so that they, the texture yeah. is not too yeah. bad. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So I, um, what I've done, and you can this, you can Google a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, I've uh, collected enough so it's a reasonable size, so maybe you know a dozen eggs or whatever. But it's got to be good quality eggs, otherwise yeah. you're not getting good quality calcium, are you? Yeah. So um, and uh, so I dry them, uh, so wash them, dry them, then grind them up really, really, really fine. And then when I go to use them in something, um, I'll often put. Uh, I usually put some lemon juice in with it too, so it starts to break it down because otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. you're not actually going to be able to absorb any of it. So that citric acid is needed to, to break it down to make it digestible. Um, so, And I'll put it in a muffin, uh, maybe a uh-huh. half a teaspoon, wow. or a quarter of a teaspoon, because I, I don't drink milk. It's like, well, how else do I have my calcium through vegetables? Sure, but you know, how much vegetable matter do you want to consume in a day yeah. um, versus a tiny bit of eggshell? One eggshell gives you a whole day's worth. I mean, I don't need that much, so I'll yeah. get, keep it in a jar in the fridge and just use it when I need to when I think oh I haven't had oh, I haven't had much in the way of you know greens that have enough calcium so I'll, or sardines haven't had sardines for a bit mm. so I'll, you know throw in some eggshells yeah it's mm. yeah. really cool yeah it's all yes it's amazing like how versatile our food actually is you know what I mean and then how mm. much you can use the the things that we kind of like I said we, we throw away and we don't necessarily think there's a need for mm. it um mm. you know people that yeah. sometimes like I don't know, even a silly thing like potato skins, you know, potato skins make amazing mm-hmm. chips, like, you know, <laughs> put those things in the oven and you've got like a great, uh, yeah, great uh, bag and the, of chips And the there. eggshell. Yeah. And while it might sound like a lot of this is, you know, the stuff our grandparents used to do and a lot of it was, it was just using all of the food. Yeah. Um, there's even, for the eggshell stuff, there's even medical research that shows that eggshell calcium is able to have an effect on the symptoms from osteoporosis for people. So so wow. it's not as if I'm doing this random thing, oh, it's got calcium in it. No, no, no. I do my research first. I'm a, yeah. I'm a researcher. Of course. <laughs> I want to know if I'm going to be doing this, is it going to damage me or is it actually going to be okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, wow. That's so cool. That's so interesting. And um, so I just, I mean, conscious of of a, a time here, and, and we really want to talk mm. to you about this amazing thing <laughs> that uh, you are now part of, um, and that is Mars One. And mm. it's this. I mean, it, it's quite hard, I guess, for a lot of people to fathom uh, what what the whole project is and like why people would would think of doing it. Um, can you can we just talk about uh, I guess your kind of journey you know into it and um, also I'm super fascinated I guess about the selection process so the, I think you said there was mm. two hundred thousand people who who started yeah. and now there's a hundred of you so wow yeah. well yeah please talk away <laughs> <laughs> that's it um, well I mentioned earlier about when I first saw it yeah. um, saw the ad for it but I, I didn't actually apply straight away um, I did my research <laughs> I wanted to I looked up Mars One I had a look at what their funding model was I looked at their technology roadmap I looked at who their advisory board were I looked at you know I did all the research the do do due diligence on them as an organization and then I had a look as well at at me, um, what would I face? I mean, pros and cons. What would I? What am I trading off on such an extraordinary opportunity? What about the health risks? All of these sorts of stuff. So I spent um, a number of months looking at that before I put my application together. And then um, I remember doing it almost in one fell swoop. I um, I came back from a run. <laughs> I think I was training for a marathon at the time and I remember coming back from a three hour run where basically my entire application just went do 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 in my head. Oh. I went, okay, got it now. I'll sit down and just do this <laughs> <laughs> and record the video and send it all off. And so my application video, I, I look very scruffy because I've just come back from a run and so I hadn't awesome. even bothered showering. It's like, I'm just in a hoodie and sweaty and who cares, whatever. <laughs> this is me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that was the first stage was um, putting in an application and that also involved um, having to pay an application fee, there were it was almost like a, a multi-step process uh, with the the video application, the written application, and then an application fee. And the fee was really just to try and weed those out that honestly weren't serious. Yeah. I mean, 
they already ended up, they had over 200,000 that started this process, but they weeded out thousands just through making them do a few extra things, which is great. I mean, would you want to look through 200,000 applications? Yeah, no, jeez. Exactly. <laughs> so, but what was great about the um, the application fee, it wasn't that large. It was, And it was on a sliding scale based on the GDP of your country. Oh, wow. So, Australians, who are quite a wealthy nation, um, I think it cost me something like about 30 bucks, $30 oh, wow. to, oh, yes. yeah, not much. I can't even go to the movies twice for that. So, that, yeah. Mars once, movies twice. <laughs> <laughs> Take it. And it was people who were in um, developing nations, of course, had, you know, their, their application fee was neg- almost non-existent, So, which is fantastic. And thus, it yeah. represents the, the 100 who are left now. We're from a, around 34 different countries. So uh, cool. And we, I think there's there's not a continent except for Antarctica that we're, that we're not represented in. Um, so, which is awesome, really awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so we, I put the application in in June um, 2013, and then in December that year, um, I received an email from Mars One saying, "Congratulations, uh, you've been shortlisted um, with 1,057 other people. Um, go and have this ream of medical tests done." Uh, and so, fair enough. I mean, you've got to be fit to be an astronaut, and they want to exclude anybody who's a health risks, uh, who has health risks for the future. Um, and so, they, they made us do oh, everything from ECGs, vision, same sort of standard stuff that I, that I understand NASA put their um, their initial candidates through as well. Um, and then, so obviously, past that. Um, and that's it was, it was pretty cool. Actually, I'd never had an ECG done before at that time. And at the time, because I was marathon training, um, I was. <laughs> I was I was pretty fit, and my heart rate, my, my resting heart rate was 37 beats wow, per minute. Wow, that's great. <laughs> I know. I know. So when, when they took the ECG, the woman stopped afterwards and went, um, I, can I just do this again? <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Are you human? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was pretty fit. I'm, not, I'm obviously not running marathons at the moment, so my heart rate's about 50-something at the moment. So normal resting heart rate's 54-ish. She didn't yeah. say, um, Are you from Mars, did she? Um, so yeah so then after that uh, they invited 660 of us to go through an interview process and that interview process was via skype or not skype but uh, you know an online interview i mean how else do you interview 660 people from around the world you're not going to fly around the world to do it it's not efficient um so that went on when was that Oh, gosh, I think it was January 2014, my interview. Um, and and I answered, we were asked eight questions. Four of them were technical and four of them were personal. Um, and honestly, the main function of that was to see if you understood what this mission is really about. Do you, And do you know what the risks are, what you're looking to get involved with? So the questions were, the technical questions were completely about the risks, were around what happens if, you know, you're on your the life support situation and um, you've only got X amount of, um, of oxygen or whatever left, how many days do you live for and that are, and the same thing with, you know, radiation shield and some questions around that. Um, and then the, the personal stuff was more around your motivations and understanding, were you the right sort of person? And and I'd, I just approached it like I did any other job interview. Um I thought about all the people I'd employed over the years or jobs I'd gone for, and I thought, well, what would they want to know? Am I the right candidate for this job? Yeah. Do what are the qualities you bring? Why would we choose you over someone else? You know, all this all this sort of stuff. Yeah. So I prepared months, all the sorts of questions and answers, and and I was pretty bang on except for the last question. <laughs> completely threw me. I did not expect <laughs> it at all. Uh, the last question in the interview was, um, if um, I. I I'm not doing it verbatim now, so yeah. excuse the words and words. Essentially, it was if um, if you were in the first crew that got to go to Mars and uh, and you'd been there for three years now, so there's only you know, the four of the first crew and then another four come every two years, so there'll be eight of you there. Um, and then, miraculously, the technology now exists for you to return. <laughs> Would you come back? Would wow. you come back? And that wow. was like, oh, was, and in my head, I'm thinking, I wasn't waiting. I wasn't ready for that one. Yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, so I was honest. I mean, I said uh, my answer was, look, you never know until you're faced with a situation. Um, but my instinct is that, no, I won't. I wouldn't come back. And the main reason is really because, I mean, if I happen to be trained in that crew, 
uh, for what are very specialized skills in some areas, but everyone has to be trained on certain skills. Um, but only two people in each crew are going to be trained on medical procedures, for example. What if I happen to be one of those who've got a specialty in training? And if I leave, yeah. the risk to that can the risk to that community is vast. I, I, that's incredibly irresponsible. Yeah. So no, I wouldn't because uh, I'm a vital, I would be a vital part of that community. Mm. We all need each other to survive. So um, thank God that was the right answer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, <that's laughs> wow. They put a tick in that box there, oh, yeah. right? She's so, got that yeah. one. So they didn't pre-frame, like they didn't let you know beforehand what they were. They were just like, we're going to ask you. You don't even know if it was eight questions or whatever. It's just like, you're going to have an interview. No, we knew that they would be. Um, we knew the first question. That's okay. all they told us. What the first question was, which I would have never forgotten. What's your name? Um, but, uh, that's that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> why? Why would you sort of thing? Why did you sign up? Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the rest, we were told there would be some technical questions, and we'd been sent um, a lot of material to read in preparation for that. So, um, but a wealth of inf- everything from history of space flight through to the stuff on radiation to whatever, and so. You know, you can read for, you can do multiple PhDs on going to Mars. Uh, so, yeah. you know, what do you study? What do you focus on? So you really had to be smart about it. It's like, what would someone be looking for in this instance? They want to know if you really know what you're getting into. They don't want to know if you remember who was the second lander to land on Mars. Yeah. That's fascinating, but is it relevant at this stage of the situation? No, it's not. Yeah. Um, although that was interesting. I did do quite a bit of research. Yeah. <laughs> What would but you I, say to a little green man that you saw on Mars? <laughs> um, yeah, so that was so I got news in February in 2014 that I was shortlisted to the hundred, um, and that kind of blew me away. Wow. Um, it was I remember exactly where I was when I was expecting the email, um, which would either be you know, <laughs> yeah. thumbs up, thumbs down. So. And so I'd set an alarm for myself. It was going to be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Melbourne time. And I set an alarm for myself. So no matter what I was doing, I'd be able to stop and just check my emails. That was not an – I didn't need an alarm. <laughs> Completely <laughs> unnecessary. I <laughs> forget about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and I'd booked, um, <clears throat> I'd booked a little treat for myself afterwards. I decided that regardless of what happens, um, I went and had a flotation tank. So I either thought mm. – I'm going to pretend to be in weightlessness, as in like, yay, I'm through, oh, hooray, yeah. here I am being weightless like an astronaut, or I'm going to go and meditate and drown my sorrows. Yeah. <laughs> in water that you can't drown in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, uh, so, so, that, so, so, I mean, that's already four years ago, like, you know, and there's still the hundred. It's, uh, it's yeah, obviously it's a long a process, of- isn't it? Like to for them to sort of whittle it down to the final final few yeah some of the stuff that's taking uh, that's taken um that i guess made it go a lot longer was the fact that mars one um expanded their funding model to go onto the stock market um and i mean I, i'm not from mars one so i can't tell you all the ins and outs of some of the stuff they did uh, but that's not something you can do in a hurry <laughs> yeah, yeah. so they listed the frankfurt stock exchange and uh, which is obviously a, a very robust uh, place to do so and and so it's obviously quite a lot of extra due diligence and um, independence with auditors and all this sort of stuff so it's just it just pushed everything out um, a number of years but but what that also did though the way when they went on the stock exchange um, they pushed things out too so that it would allow anyone that continued to invest in them to get a longer return on investment period so they're quite smart about that um, they've just allowed those periods of time to I guess just extends so the, the returns greater. Um, does it make a big difference to to those of us who are still in the hundred? Not a great deal. I mean, we'll all be a couple of years older, but does that matter? Maybe, maybe not. Um, not real. I don't think so. I mean, I'm 48 now. Um, if I'm lucky enough to get to go in the first crew in 2031, I'd be in my early 60s. But the oldest person who's been in space has been 77. Okay. So. And as we see, actually fascinating, um, some recent information from Scott and Mark Kelly, the um, NASA astronauts that one went and spent a year in space and the other one stayed on Earth. And oh, some yeah. information that came out only recently about um, the twin that was in space. When he, he, he Two years later, they found that his, his telomeres are longer no way. Wow. than they were. 
than his twin. I know. So how exciting is that? Yeah. Um, the idea potentially that spaceflight could uh, could preserve or lengthen our tel- telomeres huh. is is pretty cool for longevity. Um, so that's fascinating. Being a twin, I was quite interested in that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. That's... Has that got to do with the, the speed that you're flying at and relativity or something like that? I don't know. I don't know whether gravity plays a role. I mean, gravity is really important to send signals, so cellular signals. We know that plants grow a little bit differently in space. Um, spiders weave their webs a bit differently and so on. So, so potentially, possibly gravity no. is, is doing something there. I don't know. No, we don't know. Though. We don't wow. know mechanism this is the first that this information is only just come out we can theorize as much as we like mm. yeah so so at what point uh, did you sort of start discussing this with friends and family and say i'm, I'm wanting to do this and what was their reaction <laughs> <laughs> well i didn't actually tell anybody except my best mate yeah. and my partner at the time uh, when i was applying uh, i didn't tell my folks so i didn't i thought well i don't need to know it's a need to know basis <laughs> Why it's stress still a while. It's still a while. And also, what if I don't get, I mean, when I saw that at that time that there were hundreds of thousands of people that were interested in applying um, and there'd been thousands and thousands of applications um, when I was looking to put mine up, and I thought, oh, the chance of me winning the lotto, so to speak, yeah. uh, pretty slim, but it's going to be nil if I don't put a, an entry in at all. Um, so, so I thought, oh, well, I won't worry about telling my folks unless I get through the first stage of selection. And then... You know, I'll have those discussions. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so yeah, when I found out that I had been shortlisted in December uh, 2013, that was, I was actually overseas at the time. And in Denmark, I was doing a university intensive over there for a few weeks. And, uh, and I got the email. I was like, oh, oh I better tell mum. Wow. <laughs> what if, what if there's only 1,058 of us left? What Jeez. if it gets in the news in Australia? And at that time, there was only 24 Australians. And there's now only seven Australians. So if there's 24 then, I thought, oh, it might get in the news, though. Jeepers, I'd t- better tell mum before it gets in the paper. <laughs> that wouldn't be cool, yeah. She read about yeah. it in the paper before yeah, you told her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not so good. Um, but and my family have been fantastic and my friends too, really supportive. It hasn't been – I don't think it was a real surprise to them in some ways that I applied because I've done some um, pretty gutsy things, I guess you could say, um, you know, jumped out of planes, I've ridden my bike like thousands of kilometres, um, sailed in a tall ship in the Southern Ocean, um, done all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so, you know, I guess this was, you know, ultra marathon, blah, blah. Um, and this was just for some people that, oh, of course you're doing something extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is Mars, right? You said it's Mars. It is one way, right? <laughs> so the one way. The one way thing that tends to get people a little bit, they sort of get over that hurdle and then they're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. I mean, it's, it's totally understandable because it's like we think in terms of, I guess, it's hard to imagine forever, you know, or, or, or I don't know. I just think as a human being, we think our ability to think in big numbers and, and you know, like we can think, first of all, how far it is, how long it will take you to get there. How many people mm. applied? How long are you never coming home? It's it's a weird thing to sort of comprehend, but and uh, but for you that sounds like it wasn't really ever a massive massive factor. It was just like this is where I am, or, and the people I'm with, and the purpose I've been given with this. I'm going to just go with that, and that's really what counts. Yeah. Which I think is actually quite a really cool message, just to for, yeah. for people out there, whoever wherever you are, just make the most of what you want to do with your life and. and and mm-hmm. surround yourself with people that you are like pushing you and you're going to just feel really good and move to a good place, you know? Yeah, it's, that whole, it's some of those um, philosophies that uh, – I don't know if you guys have read Eckhart Tolle's book, Power of Now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it, you know, that whole thing of – you can worry about problems or, or be consumed by things from the past, but we only have now. This is – it's yeah. just a continuous sequence of nows. So mm-hmm. – why not make this now something as extraordinary as it can be? Allow it to be its endless, boundless, possible self. Yeah, cool. um, and that's kind of what I try and live like that. doesn't mean I do every moment. Of course, you know, you get caught up with something. Like, oh, I need, I need to do this thing. Yeah. 
okay, sometimes you need to deal with the situation, but some but we we over problemize things. I think we we turn things into problems that don't need to be there. Whether it, sometimes it's because we we feel we need to you know my worth. I need I need to solve this problem. I need to be the great problem solver, and it's okay. I've got this covered, um, or whatever it is. It, maybe we get addicted to having problems. It, who knows what it is? Um, but the, the more we can just think now about what I can do in this moment, um, the much more settled we are in the decisions we make in life. Uh, and it, and I guess because of that, it wasn't a difficult decision to make mm. because it was made in that now. Yeah, yeah. You just, I mean, still very. It's still a very brave, brave decision to make. I think. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So so like what. Is there anything like interesting, I guess, you can tell us about the, you know, the, the selection process and what, what sort of mm. you have to go through in the coming years? Like, you know, I'm sure there's some crazy mm. things. Yeah, so the next round of selection that's coming, which will trim the 20, uh, down to 20, 12 to 24 people, um, it's sort of a two-stage process. So the 100 of us will be all brought together in the one place. And uh, we, in advance of that, we have had to self-organize into 10 diverse teams of 10. So gender, age, and culture diverse, completely different you know, mixes of people. Um, and so we're going to go into these up to five days of, of different challenges together where we compete but also not as well because at the end of each day, uh, the selection committee are going to kick out 10 to 20 of us. Wow. And then the next day, wow. we still... Yeah, well, then we self-organize into new teams <laughs> that are diverse in gender, age, and um, and culture as well. Same thing, kick out more that night. Next day, new teams again. And so I think it's fantastic because you, you can't have silo thinking. Yeah. You, you can't have that ownership or power of information or anything. It serves no purpose when you have to be able to help maybe somebody who's your competitor today is going to be your colleague wow. tomorrow. Yeah, um, so cool. It means, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And we, the hundred of us, um, in the most part, we keep in touch pretty regularly through, you know, private groups and social media and the like. Uh, and we've pretty much sorted ourselves into our teams, our initial teams. But I know that, you know, I might be in team blue today, but tomorrow if I'm lucky enough to get through, I'll, I could be in green, yellow, black yeah. whatever i don't know so there's no point in me not sharing anything with those guys that, that might help them and and thus it might help me too in doing so it's if you're going to be 100 percent reliant on, on each other for survival for mars yeah we have to learn to work that way here first yeah there's no other so way the, like is there like yeah. you yeah. have to just collaborate like and work together yeah exactly yeah so it's kind of the process. It's almost a collaborative, collaborative, competitive sort of notion, it's um, which so is pretty, interesting, yeah. pretty interesting. And so that process will go over five days, and that will trim us down to about forty. And those forty will then go into the final step, uh, which is an isolation um, experiment where we're locked away in very small teams for um, I think it's like about a, a nine days or something, um, where we'll go through having to solve difficult problems, um, in small teams under duress. Oh. There's no escape. It's not like you're going, it's not like you're going to your hotel room that night. You, you're stuck in that same space together. Um, and, and then at the end of that period, they'll, they'll choose, you know, a number oh. of people to then go and have a four hour interview, uh, before being offered Jeez. a contract as an astronaut can, um, as an astronaut then to start training. That's, that's mm. when things get really real by the sounds of it. Like when you, yeah. you know, a room yeah. like that you stuck and they and it's interesting because they obviously going to be watching you and and you don't know what they're looking for are you they're looking for this competitive side of me or they're looking for mm. let's all be friends and you know they're obviously going to be selecting from certain specific things and you guys probably Absolutely. won't be privy to that information so it'll yeah. be interesting to see how yeah this is going to be super interesting to hear how that all goes yeah, we do know some elements of it. So um, we know that um, we know that they're going to try and induce some degree of conflict um, because they want to see how we solve that and move forward positively and progress towards that. And conflict doesn't have to be an argument. It doesn't yeah, have to course. be, oh, I hate you, I hate you. Conflict could just be, Gareth, you've got a fantastic idea for the next podcast and, uh, and perhaps, Craig, you have a great idea. So how do you work yeah. out which one you're going to do? Yeah, true. Without... Yeah. 
making the other one feel they're not valued. So, yeah. you know, conflict doesn't have to be an argument. Um, but still, there are still ways of respecting each other and, and f- trying to find the best solution um, that's going to work for the, the outcome that you're trying to achieve. So that's what they're looking for, that sort of stuff. How well you work with other people, yeah, really. So, yeah. do, do you fit? Do you yeah, of fit? Course. Well, mm. you can be, the, you you can be the smartest person in the world, but do you work well with others? Can you communicate? Yeah. All those sorts of things. Do you, do you think you already have all the answers or are actually yeah. are you prepared to ask others and r- admit like you do as you as you get a bit older, that the more you know, the less you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, so many many threads threads there's so yeah. many threads yeah. to it. There's so many threads to it. It's it's incredible. And it's what, fantastic process. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's it's fascinating. Mm. And you know what? It's weird. It's interesting because it's almost like a fine line between uh, torture and um, like I know I'm I'm kind of being genuine. Yeah, mm. like like. You know, the type of training you go through, it, it has similarities, you know what I mean? Like mm. being confined to small areas for such a long time with mm. people that you don't know that well uh, in person. Mm. And you know what I mean? Like there's, there's yeah, kind sensory of like deprivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For and, sure. And that's, I mean, yeah. that's some of the stuff that um, whoever's lucky enough to get through and start training, some of the, the personal training and the team training will be around how we deal with those difficult situations, the isolation, um, the, the mental health and so on, and how we work as a unit to support each other. Um, and that's, I mean, I've been doing quite a bit of work on that personally leading into this because I thought, well, it doesn't hurt to have, you know, a, a bit of a pathway into this already because then at least I can be the best I, best me I can be on the day so for the team or teams that I'm in um, and then that makes life easier for everybody. So I've been working with a psychologist, um, I do journaling, I've been doing, uh, I've been meeting with people that have lived in or worked in really isolating environments whether they're submariners, um, people in the Antarctic, um, uh, people who've been in solitary confinement in prison. Um, so a real variety of people to try and learn. the le- Like the great guests you have on this show, yeah. everybody's got a story. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. got a story. You just If you just take the time to ask the question, they're prepared to share it. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it is such a, such a really, really like something obviously that gels with what the way we think as well but i mean just the kind of people that you're dealing with specifically Mm. and the amount of knowledge that you're getting through putting yourself in this weird difficult interesting situation but then by doing that the kind of stuff that you're experiencing and and growth it's just it's such a Mm. good reason for people to challenge themselves maybe not to go one way to mars (laughs) but like to challenge themselves and then and then you just grow from there so much it's so interesting yeah Yeah. you you know what i find and i I think sorry sorry, no no, i was gonna say you know it's like just sort of in line with what craig's saying there like you you're gonna like if you if you get to the last stages or even now already you know like you you mm. you've learned so much but the people that get to those last stages are going to become these sort of incredible humans with such great knowledge mm. and experience yeah. and things to share that it'll be mm. such a big loss for them to ah. leave but then at the same <laughs> time you have these amazing people that are going to create a new civilization in a way on a uh, you know another planet so you you're starting from a really great base um mm. it's just an interesting way when you think about it you know what i mean like it's crazy yeah well, and what's fantastic because mars one um are going to be filming quite a bit of this so they'll be filming um elements of the selection process that's coming up and then obviously the training program and so on because they wish to make documentary style series for that and so there's what you're touching on there gareth about the learning you know the, the lessons that we have the opportunity to, to share yeah. it will be shared okay cool yeah, it will yeah. be shared yeah, so it's just great. i mean the, imagine the cross-cultural stuff i mean mars yeah. one one of the concepts that I've heard uh, mentioned from the um, the head of the um, of the selection panel, that's uh, Dr. Kraft. I've heard him mention at one stage that we'd be potentially spending each crew of four would spend a number of months in each other's countries because we're from different countries mm-hmm. to to learn the languages and understand the culture. Wow! So that's when so we yeah. yeah, so imagine that sort of stuff being shared around the world, where we actually are discovering about difference in a way that recognizes and celebrates it instead of yeah, separates it of course i think it's fantastic yeah, yeah I agree. fantastic it's so so powerful wow 
<laughs> yeah. yeah i think uh and and so so when does all this kind of stuff happen when is the next mm. the next phase where you guys all meet up when does that yeah take place? Uh, that's going to be happening from what i understand later this year we haven't been given the date yet uh, but we've been told that we'll have six months notice because you know people have annual leave they've got a book etc cetera, etc cetera. um but we have had some positive um news recently from some things that are happening with mars one that are progressing towards towards this so some funding announcements and right. the like so um so yeah so we're we're all pretty excited but it's just sort of i guess it's interesting like how do you stay focused on something which is a really really long-term goal uh while still doing uh, yeah. living now day to day um, yeah yeah so i guess i i balance both i, I try and I obviously enjoy both, whether they're those long-term visions, but I, I do things that are a part of that in my life today. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit about my mental health and, and so forth, like preparing for the challenges of, of isolation and that, that stressful environment. Um, but when I had a look at what the health risks were that astronauts face, I essentially put together a bit of a, a program for myself, like, well, okay, uh, I'm not – the person who can be there, I, Diane McGrath 2013 is not Diane 2.0 that needs to be there yeah. in 2031. I need to be a totally different person. So that's when I started tapping into elements of, I mean, I know the, the buzzword of biohacking, but I started to play around with a ketogenic diet, with different ways of increasing bone mass, with uh, vision, um, I've repaired elements of my vision, all sorts of stuff. I started playing around with things based on what the, the main health risks were that astronauts face. Uh, so, at the, And so what I've done is I've made this potential future that I don't know if it's a certainty or not valid in my life today as well in huh. ways that, you know, are now without being a problem. If that makes sense? Yeah, total sense. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. So now. you're still living in your now. Yeah. Totally, like 100% congruent with, with what you believe, but still, yeah. it's still like you, it's still part of the, the goals and the vision that, that you have. I mean, that sounds, it Absolutely. sounds like an ideal sort of a mix mm. that you've got going there because at the same time you're educating because I think, yeah, it's one mm. aspect that we really love is just seeing all the stuff that you're doing and wow, let me try some of that. And and it's actually, it's still valid to everyone else that's not going to Mars because it's just mm. health and your body mm. and every mm. day and, and, and social um, issues that we can all sort of identify with right here. But in your mind, you obviously still got that real bigger picture of it, but it yep. still relates to the, the Joe blog on the street, you know? Yeah. yeah, and that's. I think that's why I, I try and share some of my experimental sort of stuff on social sure. media um, when I'm like, you know, the plastic stuff. But, you know, one of the other experiments was I went without alcohol for the whole year last year um, and, you know, cut grains for 100% for the whole year. And this year, um, you know, I'm not doing anything for a whole year, but I'm doing lots of smaller experiments. Mm. Um, I'm doing it pretty soon. I'm going to be doing a... Um, um, a whole body cryo experiment because I do um, whole body cryotherapy usually uh, at a monthly basis and it's fantastic um, but I'm going to do uh, a protocol for not quite two weeks uh, but daily for about I think it's 10 days is the research I've been looking at around this so you know at the moment I'm sort of working up all the stuff I want to measure beforehand because I'm a scientist. <laughs> yeah. If you don't, you metrics, if you don't measure yeah. it, if you're not, oh, yeah, a, if you don't measure yeah. it, you're just practicing, aren't you? Really. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I, so stats matter. Um, so I want to see what baseline is beforehand on a whole lot of different metrics, and then measure at the end and see what happens from that. Um, yes, I've seen lots of research out there, but a lot of clinical research is is so it's not contrived sounds like the, the wrong word but it's it's obviously manufactured so that it fits exactly within this protocol which isn't a real life situation i want to use my real life experience of it to go okay is what i've seen in the research valid not valid uh, yeah. and does it have it convey the health benefits that i think this can convey same thing with the stuff i've done with um autophagy and that with um trying to heal elements of my of my health mm. And when we say okay. cryo, you're talking about like cold therapy, is that right? Or is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And and is 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 it like, what does it involve exactly? Are you going to go into chambers, or are you going to be doing lots of like ice baths and that sort of stuff? No, um, um, chambers. So chambers. I think it's about minus minus one twenty. I think is the temperature. Uh, Celsius. That is Celsius. Um, so I would spend <laughs> yeah. So I'll spend three month uh, three minutes in there. 
Um, I just wear bathers um, and some mittens, uh, earmuffs and some socks uh, and some obviously shoes. And uh, uh, so then I'll do that for three minutes and then I come out and then I get on a, an exercise bike to get my body, my core temperature back up. For I'll do that for about 10 minutes and then I get back in again for another three minutes. And so the last time I did it, because I do it about once a month, um, I my core temperature dropped from about 30, it was summer, so 37 or 36, 37, down to about five. What? Um, yeah, five in three minutes. But then it was up no at like way. 33. Wow. Yeah, then it was up at 33 again um, within 10 minutes. And then How were you measuring your again. core temperature? Uh, with a, um, like a thermometer, a laser thermometer oh, wow. in the chest. So, so okay, so like... If your body temperature goes up, like, say, one degree, you know, say to whatever mm-hmm. it is, 37 and a half, 38, like, that's really bad. Mm. But then to bring it down to five is actually not that bad. Is that what we kind of almost, we, we're, we're testing? I mean, how do, can you just explain yes. a little bit about that? Sorry. So we're, we're trying to induce a heat shock response. It sounds, I, I know it's cold, <laughs> yeah. but it's a, it's a shock response to the body. And this shock response um, then starts to trigger all these other cascades of immune um, function. So you actually tend to find that a lot of the immune markers improve. So immune function improves. Uh, people who have rheumatoid arthritis often have a lot of relief of pain from rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's been used, whole body cryo or cryotherapy has been used to um, repair vision impairment for babies who have had retinal removal, um, you know, just through injury or whatever, or birth. Um, uh, it, it just, the range of treatments that cryotherapy has been sh- shown in, in the literature, so in the uh, medical literature to be effective for, are really quite extraordinary. Uh, and one of the other things it does, which is quite fascinating, um, because it it seems to um, touch on vagal conditioning. So this is the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Again, we go back to the HRV, heart rate variability. Um, it induces uh, almost a almost a euphoria yeah. if you do it for a while. Um, so when I leave after doing a, a double session, um, I tend to find like any aches or pains I have, I can't feel a thing, and I feel fan like I feel fantastic as in emotionally and that it's it's, it's really quite addictive. Um, so I've, I'm, I wanted to do an experiment to see, well, what happens if I do it for X amount of days in a row? Because just doing it once, nice. Yeah. It's a nice little treat once a month. Um, what are the longer-term health, health outcomes by mm. doing it for a, um, a 10-day period? So I'll measure the stuff before and after, but then I want to do measurements again, you know, months down the track to see, well, has this been sustained? Okay, yeah. That's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. And, and I think we, we need to ask you, like, at least one of those times to, to not put on your gloves and your socks. <laughs> 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 hey, like, really, really test yourself. <laughs> well, I did... I've done Wim Hof training. I don't, okay. Do you guys know yeah, Wim Hof? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've done his yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've done his training and that. So, um, which is was pretty cool. Um, but I've, but I used to do yeah um, cold exposure prior to to doing Wim. So oh, I used to go and submerge myself in the the cold plunge pool for, and I'd meditate in there for like twenty minutes or something um, at the gym. So I'd go from sauna to plunge to sauna to plunge, yeah. sort of thing. So I'd have that real shock. Um, and yeah, just a it just feels so good afterwards. Yeah. I know it sounds insane, but you actually feel fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I was reading some interesting um, reviews by Rhonda Patrick. I presume you've uh, yeah, checked yeah, some of her stuff. And she was mm. talking about um, sauna, the use of heat mm. um, for like cardiovascular health and stuff. And there's so many like interesting things out there like this that's, that you can experiment with, obviously under mm. the right circumstances and the right guidance and what have you. But yeah, yeah, exactly. um, you know, it, the cool thing is, like, I don't think in in real re, in reality I would go and get into that ice ch- a cryo chamber for like five six days in a row. But you're gonna go and do that, and I'm like, literally can't wait to to <laughs> to see how this goes. You know, like, <laughs> sounds like a really awesome experiment. And and the cool thing is, like you say, you've got all your metrics. You can actually see how it affected your yeah. body. But then you're also like. I felt like crap or whatever. I felt amazing. Yeah, 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 and you're getting yeah, yeah. the subjective and the objective stuff together, which is yeah. really cool. <laughs> well, the sauna stuff's interesting because I do regular sauna. And uh, and I, like, I've had a look at quite a bit of the, the research there, so the Finnish sauna studies. Uh, and the, we, we see an interesting, some interesting results there where people, when they've 
I mean, they sauna at least three times a week for a minimum of 20 minutes each time. It has to be above about, I think it's got to be above about 68 degrees Celsius, I think roughly. I can't recall the exact figure now. Um, I'm sure Dr. Patrick would, would be able to confirm what it is. Um, but uh, you get the same sort of cardiovascular response if you've gone for a run. So, yeah. And I wear, I make sure, I, I often wear my um, my heart rate monitor yeah. in there as well. So I'll watch it. So I'll be sitting in there and I'll, I'll get in first after I've worked out in the gym. I'll, I'll get in there and my heart rate will be like 50 something to start with. And then I'll watch it shoom, climb up to the same sort of pace as if I'm running. Huh. Um, and it's comfy, comfy, comfy. And I, and you get you can get better effects if you're if you're looking for performance endurance performance if you're there for 30 minutes but most people can't sort of push it past around 20 20 is pretty extreme um, but yeah it does get you up to the same heart rate as if you're running and That's then so of course good. you don't have you don't have to run and it improves <laughs> I've, I've noticed it improving my vo2 max as well so oh, personally yeah. vo2 max has improved wow. without me having to run wow that's insane that's crazy oh cool <laughs> yeah wow so geez uh, and this has been like one of the most incredible chats like just so fascinating uh talking to you and about everything you've kind of put yourself through and that uh, just just before we finish off like what is the best way um for people to i guess follow you and to find out more about you and get in touch if they you know if they have any questions or anything like that yeah so um for those who just want to get the occasional information about what's happening with um, Mars One and me and Mars One, I'm on Facebook, so Di McGrath, Mars One astronaut candidate. Uh, but people want to follow my, my random stuff like this, the experiments and that. Um, Instagram is probably best, uh, at DA McGrath on Instagram. And then I share actually quite a bit of science um, and studies and that on Twitter. So you'll find... Maybe a few times a week, I'll flick something up on Twitter, which is new research in a certain area. Um, oh. So that's um, my Twitter handle is at light and portable, L I T E A N D portable. So okay. that's right. probably we'll the best ways to, to follow me. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely add that into the to the show notes, and uh, you know, just it, it's quite hard to put into words how. Uh, informative and how interesting this chat's been and i also feel like we haven't really <laughs> random. Like, touched no <laughs> random's good and and like the amount of stuff that we actually didn't get onto today I, that that I, all these questions i really would have loved to have touched on um you know there's so much that gareth and i wanted to chat to you about but anyway we've had a great chat and we really are grateful for uh, the extra time that you've given us today, no worries, uh, it means a lot to us and uh, we are very grateful and we just can't wait to see how everything turns out, we, you know, and and, um, and and the places you're going and the experiments you're going to do, uh, I think they're super valuable. So keep them up and uh, and just thanks again uh, so, so, so very much. No worries. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no worries. Thanks a lot. And just, I mean, just from my side, I just want to also say like a massive thank you to you like just for like sharing your story like uh, first of all like it, it's it's been one of the most interesting <laughs> chats i've ever had like uh, and like craig said that we we haven't explored half the things we were, we were wanting to because the conversation was so interesting and um also just want to kind of say thanks for like as a human putting yourself out there and experimenting you know what i mean and like kind of leading the way and and showing the way for us as other humans and it, you know you you basically stoke our own curiosity uh within <laughs> ourselves to kind of want us to do do things like that as well which is which is really kind of cool. motivational and inspiring and you are you are a fantastic lady and you know I'm super interested in everything that you you spoken about and everything that you're doing and we we're really rooting for you even though we don't want to see you go we want to see you go do you know what I mean like yeah. we want to see that yeah, list thanks. of of two or four people uh, with your name on it and um we can't wait to kind of watch the rest of your journey it's been uh, yeah it's going to be so exciting and and just thanks so much for you know letting us have uh, so much time of yours no worries. It's been fantastic. Thanks, guys. Yeah, cool. Thank All you right. very much. Take cool. care. All right.